Yeah. Okay. Seeing um, a presence of a quorum, I'm calling this meeting to order at uh, 6.32. So our first order of business is to approve our minutes from February 11th. Mr. Demley? Um, yeah, just a um, small omission in attendance. I should be listed there. Approve the minutes of February 11th, 2020. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signal by raising your hand. It's unanimous, 6 0. And now we have um, our long awaited uh, student presentation <laughs> on water bottle filling. Yep, and I'll do a very brief introduction that we have three students here with us tonight. You can see their names up on the screen. And uh, while they're currently working on some uh, very neat things at the high school, this is really about their work when they were middle school students and uh, what they successfully advocated for and accomplished and is still in effect today. So one of the three of you come up and introduce yourselves and I'll handle the slides. Um, I'm Tessa Kaywall. I'm Lucy Smith. I'm April Schilling. So hi everyone and thank you for letting us present the Water Bottle Project. Today we're going to be sharing our overall process and the results so far of this project which we started in 8th grade and have continued throughout this year. Please feel free to ask us any questions you have about specific details after the presentation. Um, we thought of the idea for the filler one day when we were in Environmental Action Club run by Ms. Wellborn at the middle school. Walking through the school we saw many littered plastic bottles and realized how much plastic waste our school produced. And how, because of the plastic bottles sold at lunch. Um, the solution that we came up with was to instead sell reusable water bottles. We thought that a big selling point for the bottles would be if we had a water bottle filler near the cafeteria instead of just one near the gym, which would encourage students to fill their bottles. We thought the reason behind kids buying plastic bottles was because they didn't have a reusable one. We wanted to provide the students with reusable ones so that the school would need to be, buy less and less plastic bottles, eventually not purchasing any at all. When we looked up the cost of the filler, it seemed too expensive to purchase. We never thought we could raise nearly $2,000 as well as money for the bottles, so we brought our idea and our problem to the principals at the middle school. Our plan was to first meet with the principals to see if any of this was even possible, and at the end of our first meeting, we left his room with the plan to fundraise for the bottles as well as the filler. We came up with the ideas for raising large sums of money through GoFundMe accounts and fundraisers. We then refined our ideas into a plan. We were going to host a student versus staff game of some type, start a GoFundMe account, have multiple other fundraisers such as bake sales, and hopefully raise extra money through word of mouth for our GoFundMe. Then, depending on our total fundraising amount, we would buy a filler accessible to all and buy students reusable bottles, even if we weren't going to be at the middle school by the time we finished. Finally, we started taking action. We set up the GoFundMe and planned a student versus staff volleyball game, which ended up being a huge success. After all of our fundraising, we ended up with about $2,320 of available funds at our disposal, which is much more than we thought we could ever have. Another part of our action plan was to get word out about our project. We ended up being interviewed by a reporter from the Gazette, and the article that came out about our project just a little later sparked some donations on our GoFundMe. We also held many bake sales after school, which raised around $200 each time we held one. Along with some PGO grants, extremely generous donations, a fundraiser and bake sales, we were able to gather a large sum of money to put into action in our school. Once we had enough money, we found which filler was the best and fit the characteristics for what we wanted. The school then made the purchase of the filler and had it installed over the summer. We are still continuously meeting with Principal Smith and Ms. Wellborn, who have been with us throughout the whole project and have helped us so much. Currently, we are in the process of receiving a donation of $250 from Target to add to our total funds. With this money, we are going to buy as many stainless steel water bottles as we can to offer to students when they ask for a plastic bottle. We hope this option of a free reusable water bottle will be chosen over a plastic bottle. 
Based on statistics from November from one of the kitchen managers, we were already down to one case of small bottles and two cases of large bottles per week, which is a major improvement from last year's purchases, since we are down 50%. Um, so above is a picture of the filler located in the middle school near the cafeteria. There are already roughly 4,000 bottles filled, which we'd say is a major success. <laughs> We never thought we would accomplish as much as we did, and we are very proud of the result from our project. We appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you all our long journey to where we are now. We still have lots more to do. At the high school, we are currently working on other projects, such as more environmentally friendly utensils. We hope to make a large impact on our high school as well as we try to switch over to a more environmentally aware and active school. Please don't hesitate to ask us any questions. And thank you all very much for letting us present. We would also like to add that we support the funding for solar panels at either the high school or the middle school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? Yes. Mr. Menino? I'd like to thank you for a very cogent and well-rehearsed presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan? So I, will, I want to thank the three of you for coming and doing this and all of the work that you've done along with Ms. Wellborn and the co-principals and other staff members. And I also want to thank you for the hydration station because I worked hard on the former finance director for three years to try and get a hydration <laughs> station in that exact spot, and he kept saying no, <laughs> <laughs> that they needed to be in other spots in the school and not there, so thank you very much. And I'm going to see you again when you're seniors. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Demling. So thank you for an awesome presentation. So as you continue your work at the high school, you should know that you have an open invitation to come back here. And if you think that there is some money that would help out with an effort that you've researched and gotten support for, it's totally appropriate to come back and, uh, like in the winterish, winterish time before we vote on the budget, to, to talk about that and we can have that discussion. So yes. definitely encourage you to come back and do that. The Environmental Action Club I wanted to ask you about, that sounds really great. So did you start that off in like seventh grade and like what, what are kind, of, kind of stuff does the Environmental Action Club do? Um, so we started this project in eighth grade but in seventh grade it was just the science club which was separate from environment action. So we only really started doing projects in eighth grade I guess but just it's an atmosphere where kids can like choose a project that they really enjoy to do and take on action with the support of Miss Wellborn especially and the school to back them up with things. Thank you. So I'll add, thank you. That was a really great presentation. We're looking forward. I've been following since the very beginning when you first started fundraising for it. And um, I think the, the approach that you took, sort of the, as you called it, the idea plan and action and implementation, and sort of then following up with um, researching and understand, um, defining how it's, what the outcomes are and the progress that you guys have achieved is a really great skill set and um, can be applied to future environmental action in the high school as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Just a touch of students that Principal Jones in the back of the room likes to receive uh, now that we're he's at the high school. So very politically activated, motivated, and, and connected into action. So thank you very much. That's great. Okay, so now uh, moving on to um, committee announcements and public comment. Are there any announcements from the committee first? Mr. Demling. Uh, so I wanted to thank the uh, Northampton School Committee and Laura Fallon uh, from the Northampton School Committee in particular for uh, organizing and running a workshop for the Mass Association of School Committees, our region, last night in Florence. Uh, it was a great opportunity to meet others um, on other school committees. And uh, so there's a presentation by Tracy Novick uh, on Chapter 70 and how that's been updated with the Student Opportunity Act. And if you don't know Tracy Novick, if you want to follow one person on social media uh, who knows everything and shares everything and update at the state level, uh, she is the go-to person. She's just a font of information. So she was she gave a really great in-depth presentation. Um, it was also really great because our, our Senator, Joe Comerford, was there, and she gave an update on some other efforts that are continuing. Um, you know, I think she characterized the Student Opportunity Act that got a lot of press and attention last year as a great first step, but that's what it is. It's a first step. It addressed a lot of what uh, has been inequitable in uh, state funding of public education, but there's still a lot more to go, and so she's currently focused on a Senate study looking at charter school funding. Um, there's a study looking at the municipal wealth calculation, which is a big deal. 
uh, for member towns of our region, uh, as well as the assumed percent of special ed uh, students in the foundation calculation, which is 16%, which as we all know is quite low mm -hmm. for many districts. Um, so yeah, it was a really great time to connect, and I just appreciate the, the work of our, our volunteer colleagues across the river for making that happen. Okay. Any other announcements? Um, seeing none, we'll um, open it up now for public comment. Um, and before we get started, I'll just remind um, those in the, uh, the which to make uh, comments that we that speakers are limited to three minutes. Um, it's we we don't gavel you out at exactly 3.00, but um, we ask that you um, focus on keeping your statements to three minutes or less. If your statement um, runs longer than three minutes, you may, that's fine, but you'll need to have multiple speakers for that so that um, you cannot cede, we uh, cannot cede your time to, uh, to a speaker to allow them to speak longer than that. The statement may be read by multiple speakers so long as the speakers um, may keep to that three, limp, three minute maximum. Um, so I ask, uh, please come forward and state your name and um, where you live. Hi, my name is Andrew Rose. I live in Amherst, and um, I'm speaking to the um, an item on the um, capital budget that you'll be voting on today. Um, so, uh, we uh, some the, some students had hoped to to be here to speak directly to this. Um, Saho Lee and Allison Braun and I submitted a um, proposal to Amherst to fund a solar study um, and that's being considered by um, the Amherst Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, but it relates to the 15,000 um, for a solar study in your capital budget. Um, the um, there are are differences, but there there's um, real advantages to combining th those funds. Um, in we could um, Sean Mangano suggested that could probably hire the same consultant um, for to to do the solar study that um, is going to be. Um, proposed as, as a part of your capital budget, um, which my understanding is um, would focus on the middle school, um, some uh, hill, um, and um, if there's extra, then perhaps the middle school roof. And um, the 25,000 that we are proposing um, would be looking in depth into the um, possibilities for uh, solar canopies on the middle school and high school parking lots, um, looking at the possibilities for third party purchase, which costs nothing, um, and uh, up to having our, our uh, you know, owning them and having the, um, storage, you know, to go with it. And, and there, it's a, a fairly long proposal that has a lot of little pieces in it with cool stuff like, you know, can we get the chargers? And those are all questions. Um, obviously, there's no commitment to actually funding the, the studies, but um, if Amherst decides to have the uh, proposal go through, we would, um, it would be helpful to know from the regional school committee if you were, you know, happy to have Amherst pay for that part of this um, investigation. And um, I think we'll, we'll see if we can get some time to ask that question, to have you discuss the possibility of voicing, you know, your, your um, support or indifference to Amherst paying for um, an additional study and combining it. And we certainly 
um, want the 15,000 in your capital budget to pass today. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other speakers? Good to see no more. So um, we we do have public comment until seven o'clock, um, but I think um, we'll just we'll move on since I don't see it's definitely well past six forty-five. So we'll we'll move on. Um, so next on our agenda is a superintendent's update. Yeah, and I'll be brief because much of the <coughs> update will be found in other agenda items, particularly um, about COVID-19 and the budget vote and some of the other items. Um, but I want to mention a couple things. Uh, the first is that last Friday I was able to attend a meeting. Uh, every year there's a legislative delegation that meets with superintendents and uh, all three of uh, the representative senators that represent our four towns were present. And I, to Mr. Demling's point, I'm continually impressed with their, um, the two representatives and senators' ability to understand local educational policy, ask probing questions to better understand what's happening. And, you know, um, they're not a group, right? They're individuals. But uh, I feel like there's a lot of interest, and I think that was shown in attendance and interest in the four town meetings uh, this mm -hmm. year. And there was check-ins about where we are with that. So um, just want to share that. Um, there was a group in the grade span advisory, and I will talk about that at our next <coughs> meeting, that visited JFK Middle School in Northampton uh, about a month ago. And just want to publicly thank Northampton. They um, pulled out all the stops. They had us meet with, um, and it was a group of parents and staff members, uh, counselors, classroom teachers, the principal, the PGO. So we really got a full, uh, full scale experience at Northampton uh, in a couple hours, and that was really helpful. And I think the last thing I'll mention, certainly if you would like to comment on this, you can, but you don't have to, is the high school had a career day uh, recently, last week or the week before? Last week. last week, thank you. Where we had different uh, professionals from different areas of our community come in and be able to talk to students. Uh, again, another opportunity for them to envision different careers and pathways moving forward uh, from post high school um, and really a, a wide range in roles. Um, that you know the reports I got from both Mr. Jones and Mr. Sadiq, who was primarily involved in organizing it was it was very successful in having students think about their future selves um, uh, which is which is part of adolescence so mm -hmm. it's good to help help folks along you don't have to comment but if there's anything you would like to say okay sounds good um, but that's that's the update okay. Any questions? Yeah. okay oh, we're racing right through this <laughs> Um, I, Famous last words. Right, yeah. <laughs> Leaving lots of extra time for later. Um, as the acting chair, I do not have any update for this evening. Are there any subcommittee updates? Mr. Demling. Um, so we had our uh, most recent monthly CPAC meeting last Friday. Um, the uh, continues to be a, a working group that's reviewing the results of the special ed survey. Um, some good things uh, in there, good bits of feedback. One of the main themes. Um, was about communication, uh, particularly at points of transition to new buildings, um, and uh, it was it was inter interesting to highlight, uh, particularly since you know going through the sixth grade yeah. uh, study to the um, possible studying the possible move of the sixth grade to the middle school about how transitions um, you know are unique uh, in special ed, not just because you might be uh, part of a particular program, whether that's building blocks or AIMS or ILC, but uh, depending on where you are on the continuum. Of um, special needs, your point of contact at, at a particular school might be more well known than, than others, and so you go to a new place. You know, might not necessarily know who your, your point of contact is. Um, that might be very clear. Uh, say, if you're an ILC and you meet the ILC director, but if you get, say, only certain services, and you go from, uh, you know, the big change from sixth grade to uh, the middle school is you go from one or two classes a day to, you know, potentially. Um, uh, a handful or more, and so that that idea of having one central home uh, teacher or point of contact uh, that you always can check in on and get updates uh, is uh, becomes you know a point of anxiety for students and for parents. Um, so I think as as the working group continues to review those results, it'll be good to yeah. for those two groups to have some, a little bit of uh, communication and at least just to update on what's going on because there does seem to be a lot of a lot of good overlap there. I agree. Any other subcommittee? Okay. 
Moving on to new and continuing business. And um, slowing things down, I think, yes. um, <laughs> given the topic. Um, so um, I thought a lot about how to share information about what, what I'm calling more commonly COVID-19, but I know in the media is getting talked about as coronavirus. And I thought actually this is a, today was the fourth communication to the community on it, and I actually found it instructive to go back. I'm not literally going to read the four emails, but just to talk about where we are, where we where we were, where we are, and perhaps where we're headed. I think the consistent threat has been close communication with the public health department, both locally and at the state level, and also surrounding districts, um, so that we've been consistently in touch with Julie Fetterman. I mean, she's unfortunately uh, not suggesting that she's sick of my phone calls and emails, but uh, I wouldn't blame <laughs> her if she would. She's the head of public health in, in Amherst and really works with some of the other towns as well. Um, I've also been in a lot of touch more recently with Jennifer Colkeen, who's the superintendent of Union 26, because we want to. I want to make sure that folks in Leverett and Shutesbury understand uh, what advice we're receiving in Amherst. Not that they have to agree with it, but you know, invariably there'll be families who have a fifth grader at Shutesbury Elementary and a seventh grader at the middle school and uh, separate from snow days, which is a different topic for a different day, uh, this one they really want to understand, you know, what's the thinking and, and how is it connected. So the first communication that we drafted was on February 26th, was the Wednesday after um, the February recess. And at that point, there were 53 cases in the United States and one in Massachusetts. And so the goal of this email was to assure the community that we, which is still true, we don't have any cases or suspected cases in the valley, um, in Amherst specifically, in our region, but also in the larger valley. And that we shared uh, Department, Massachusetts Department of Public Health guidance for school administrators and personnel. Uh, we looked at our custodial staff and our cleaning and our cleaning um, mechanisms. And uh, we communicated a number of ways where if people had questions, we now have a thanks to the grant that we applied for and received last year, we have a nurse manager who is the point person for any concerns. And we did receive concerns. And some of them were, I travel to X place. Uh, is there anything I need to do? My child may travel in the coming weeks. I heard someone traveled from here. And so uh, it was good that we had that initial communication, simply that there was a, there was a, a, a place to call, you know, and I can certainly answer some questions, but this is someone who's an RN and has a, a bunch of degrees about public health who can, has a little more informed opinion than I do on some of the individually specific cases. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that that first email elicited a number of families and staff members to communicate to us about autoimmune disorders that we may or may not have known about. And it may not have been the student, but it may be the student's family. We would have no knowledge of that. It may not be the staff member. It may be the staff member's partner, spouse, parent, child. And so there were already people who are on heightened alert uh, because they don't fit. They fit in that category that keeps getting mentioned in the news as like, if you fit these categories, then. And that number is a non-zero number. And it's a, it's a number that is significant to me. It's significant to us as we plan, not that we want to over plan, but uh, assuming that everyone in our community is in good health and doesn't have compromised immunity mm -hmm. is an inaccurate uh, information. And that became loud and clear as our first communication went out and we gathered more feedback. Our next communication was actually just last Friday. It was March, excuse me, March 6th. Uh, at that point, we put into effect additional cleaning mechanisms beyond what we were doing before, which was, you know, wiping down door handles, right? All those kind of common sense things that we have uh, now purchased a spray product that sprayed multiple times a day on door handles, on common area railings, mm -hmm. areas where there's a lot of physical contact and areas where viruses stay on for long periods of time. So in addition to what we were currently doing, uh, we upped the expectations and, and really Ben Harrington, who's a school member, has a dual role, and I want to compliment him and Rupert Roy Clark for being on top of this right from the very beginning, looking at what products we're using, making sure that we were um, doing that. And, and it also focused a lot on uh, what are behaviors that uh, are pro-social, proactive behaviors. So we had things like washing your hands in soap and water for 20 seconds. It's worth noting that we don't, uh, OSHA rules would not allow us to be uh, purchasing large amounts of hand sanitizer uh, to replace. Mm -hmm. The OSHA rules as well as scientific, science would tell us that washing your hands for 20 seconds is a much better strategy than hand sanitizer sure. anyway. And hand sanitizer has a significant amount of alcohol in it. And with both younger kids and older kids, we have different problems with alcohol and products mm -hmm. that are left out. Um, hence the OSHA rules are around that. So uh, we've not, we don't become the hand sanitizer police, 
but it's not our, the recommended first step for school districts or organizations. Uh, something I'm terrible at is avoid touching eyes, nose, mouth with, you know, like that's just not a strategy. And now that the camera's on me, I'm sure I'll be self-conscious and do it <laughs> about 45 times for the rest of the meeting. Uh, avoid close contact with people who are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze or tissue. Uh, use a tissue. Um, avoid sharing dish dishes, utensils. One of the feedback we got from our athletic director is, it seems commonplace on certain teams to share water bottles, mm -hmm. right? So it's the flip side of what you heard earlier from the students about individual water bottles. And so we gave clear messaging to our student athletes around um, that's not a team bonding activity. That's actually a, a germ sharing activity. And we encourage student athletes not to do it. Um, and the, the one that got a little more attention and a little more consternation perhaps was to avoid shaking hands or hugs as a greeting and substituting other measures elbow bumps, other things. And for me, I just mm -hmm. have been saying I don't shake hands right now. And that's my, been my strategy mm -hmm. uh, to use, but that we know that shaking hands is one way things get transmitted. The other thing that we talked a lot about in the letter uh, on Friday was that staff members and students should stay home if they're sick. And that seems really simple, uh, but we got a little more specific about fevers and staying home for 24 hours. And, and I think it wasn't that much a change in practice for students. However, it was a significant change in practice for staff that, you know, I think as a staff in general, it's, uh, and I'm not the best example, though I think I did well the last couple of weeks with my illness. Um, staying home is not, our staff want to be in front of, they want to do their good job and they want to be in front of students. And we really tried to advise them at this point in time, this for the safety of the community. And it's not just about COVID-19, it's about the flu, which is mm -hmm. prominent in our community, as well as many other um, things. We've started tracking on a daily basis staff and student absences. Uh, we did notice a, an increase after we sent the letter on Friday. Hard to know whether, you know, where the, whether the letter caused it or illness caused it or concern about COVID-19 caused it, but it is something that we are actively tracking on a daily basis, not necessarily on an individual level, but on an aggregate school mm -hmm. and district level um, to assess that. We also shared some resources from the CDC, the Department of Public Health, and the town of Amherst. Flip ahead to Monday. Um, so one of the things we, again, at every email say there is, you know, everything we've understood is there's no significant risk right now. We don't have any identified or suspected cases in our community. Um, but we wanted to share with staff about the uh, how to receive employee assistance, because what, what we were hearing was the level of stress on staff was significantly high working in this field. And also to, to recommend for our staff that, uh, for our students, that counselors are available if they need to talk through some of these issues. Uh, we also made our own uh, page on our website that's dedicated to um, COVID-19, which collects all the letters as well as a frequently asked questions page that's been updated uh, and links to other resources such as the town website um, Bay State actually has a really nice website that we noticed and we've included that. Um, I think today we included that on our website. So that way there's one, one place you can go for all the coronavirus and it's on our, if you go to our front page, it, you know, there's a clickable link that brings you there. Um, yesterday was also notable in that uh, multiple universities, including a college in this community, decided to take really active steps um, in not having students come back from their college spring break. Um, very different environment. UMass has not taken that step as a public uh, university, uh, but it certainly caused a lot of concern. Uh, also causing concern today was that the governor declared a state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because of this. The number of suspected cases is over 90. It's now not just in the Boston area, but has hit Berkshire County as well, mm -hmm. pretty significantly actually, if you think about the relative size of Berkshire County and seven suspected cases. They're not all confirmed, but um, and we had a meeting this morning with the Department of Public Health in the town of Amherst. And uh, the short story is they recommended that we move from the mitigation prevention phase to the preparedness phase of our response. And so that might be some, feel like some lingo, but what it essentially means, uh, and this was communicated this afternoon, is that uh, we maintain school operations as they are. So it doesn't mean that if there's an itinerant staff member, for instance, some special educators might work in more than one building, that we change the protocol for that staff member working in more than one building. Uh, we maintain our daily mission around students uh, as it pertains to the school day. However, uh, there are pretty significant changes to anything that's not explicitly defined as in terms of 
the core mission on a daily basis of our schools. So the recommendations, and, and, and someone asked me today, are they recommendations or are they mandates from the health department? And for me, there's no distance between recommendations and mandates from the health department. When the, whether it's the state health department or the local health department makes recommendations, they're the experts in this area, and they're concerned not just about our students, but the larger area, and it's a public health crisis that we're facing. Um, so one thing they recommended is that all field trips be canceled for the rest of the school year. Uh, field trips are a wonderful um, support for our students. Uh, I can speak uh, volumes about the value, and yet can school exist without field trips in a productive way? And the answer is yes to that. And so we have canceled field trips for the rest of the year. The reality is the field trips are canceling on us anyway. So we had a number of trips, trips to Amherst College. Those were canceled long before I put this out. Uh, and many other communities um, have asked that, that, you know, different things that we were planning to do have gotten canceled because of this, because of uh, the response. The second point that we made today were that all of, uh, out of district, and this one more to staff, but I want to share it with the larger community, uh, all out of district and district-wide professional development is eff effectively canceled for the rest of the school year. Required professional development, like safety care, which is something we provide for staff, will be done on a school-by-school -school basis. So we're not um, unnecessarily combining school staff uh, for training. So it's going to be a little cumbersome, a little inefficient, but we'll still be able to provide the meaningful PD that we need, professional development we need to do. Uh, but we're not taking staff out of district to go to other PD uh, elsewhere. Um, another recommendation was to reduce the evening events that have more than 50 participants until it's felt to be safer uh, for our community. And um, so that has already affected like Wildwood staff, Wildwood Math Night, Fort Rivers Math Night, uh, the registration for kindergarten. We're still registering students for kindergarten, but we're not having the major event that brings together last year probably 120 people. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not doing that. Same for the ninth grade registration night. We're going to move to electronic uh, communication around those things. Um, and the really hard one was um, the musical. So I want to be really clear about that. And uh, this is one we held off more, longer than most communities uh, around canceling events like this. And Principal Jones was uh, very helpful. We met with, uh, we met this morning as an administrative team. Uh, we then met uh, Mr. Jo Principal Jones, myself, and, and Mr. Bechtold. Uh, and thank goodness we have creative thinkers on our staff. Uh, but one of the things that I heard from Mr. Bechtold was we have to figure out a way for the students to be able to perform. They've worked way too hard for this to be, uh, you know. And he, he understood the context. He understood the rationale and the reasoning. And so the two fronts we're working on, I think there's been progress even since we talked, you know, not that long ago, um, this afternoon. Uh, we're one trying to think of a school based school a set of school based performances where students would be with their classes that, that they'd normally be with with at least a six foot buffer, which is the recommendation we received so there'd be an authentic student audience and students would be able to perform the show with an audience, not just in an empty auditorium. Mm -hmm. The second part is trying to figure out whether we live stream or can tape a performance and share it with the larger community it 's a really powerful show we 'd want to do that there 's some copyright trademark. Mm -hmm. details that we have to work out on that second part. Uh, my experience so far is that people have been very understanding of the public health crisis going on and very willing to be flexible with things like copyright trademark. However, until you ask and get confirmation, I can't, we can't commit to that. Uh, but I really want to thank Mr. Beckhold, Mr. Bechtold and Mr. Jones for thinking of creative solutions in the current climate of how to manage this. Um, we're having, this is not just about the schools. This is for anything happening on school property. So for instance, there's LSSC basketball game tomorrow. Um, and we're concerned about the number of people. So the athletic director has been working with LSSC about how might we limit participation. I think they're middle school students. Um, how might we limit participation of spectators even in that setting? Um, it's going to hit, I, there's a town councilor here. So I've already talked to the town manager about if, if it's going to be, um, district meetings and it's, we expect more than 50 people, we're going to have to figure out, the town's going to have to figure out a different way to do that. Because in our schools, we're going to follow the recommendation from the Board of Health, which is to limit events that happen in our schools. You might be thinking about these meetings you have right now. Um, and the participation, we're under 50, I counted. Um, but um, with the state of emergency declared in Massachusetts, uh, 
the, my understanding is, although that's not confirmed, I know the town manager did reach out to the state around this, that it does relax quorum rules and remote participation. I'm not sure we're quite there in terms of school committee meetings. We haven't had 50 people in, in a while. Um, but you can't guarantee that you will or won't have a certain number. And I think as this develops, uh, we'll have to focus. Another piece that we took with the support of our local colleges, although frankly there are less of them that we need to get in touch with this afternoon than when we planned this, is that we uh, inventoried um, pre-practicum students, student teachers, and university students who volunteer in our schools about their travel plans next week. Now, I want to be really clear that that's not because I think anyone's going to Northern Italy or Iran or China or South Korea next week. However, where they go may become a level three zone where they would have to be quarantined. And with, uh, with, with the, the break coming up for students, we thought it was incumbent on us for the protection of our 2,600 students and our staff and faculty that we were simply asking the question not out of um, curiosity, mm -hmm but that we would have an active record of where students went. Because frankly, um, hard for me to not say a specific place because then it goes to a place. They may go to a county of a state. Uh, and at the time they go there, there's no restrictions. And at the time they come back, there may be a need to quarantine because this is a fast moving, evolving mm -hmm. situation. And with our staff, with our families, we have ways to, to talk about that with people who are more itinerant in our schools. We don't, and particularly with the break coming up, we did ask. Now, the reality is we don't have to ask Amherst College students that right now, uh, nor Smith College students that right now, but we uh, worked with UMass and had great conversations, including with their, uh, their emergency management people on what we would do if this scenario happened, and we worked out protocols. So I want to publicly thank the university for engaging us um, uh, in multiple conversations over the last couple of days. Um, and, and they sent a preemptive email out to their student teacher saying, please participate, this is really important. The district's not looking to share this information with us unless it's a public health crisis. Um, you know, so we're not, it's not information that's being shared with principals or anybody, it's Ms. Westmoreland and I having this information uh, and then keeping track of um, if things develop in a certain way, what we would need to do with it and we worked out those protocols with UMass. The last thing that uh, the email to staff had, and I think this is really important, um, just as important as any of the other items actually, is it included a list of classroom resources that Mr. Sheehan, I asked Mr. Sheehan to organize uh, to be able to talk to students about COVID-19. One of the things we know is that we're getting students who are very stressed by it, students who are not at all stressed by it, probably more less stressed than we want them to be, frankly, in terms of promoting good, good healthy behavior, and then everything in between. And while well, our counselors have done that, uh, there are really outstanding lessons that have been developed for students as young as preschool uh, and as old as um, students sitting next to me in high school. And uh, we sent that out as an organized list, both in terms of the implications of COVID-19, what it is and the science of it, and the racism and other xenophobia that's occurring. So kind of all three of those had lessons at different uh, lesson plans at each different level that we wanted to communicate to teachers because we have hearing very clearly from teachers that they wanted to have resources um, that they could work with students on during advisory, during other periods of time. Um, I want to recognize that this is a time of high stress for many, many people. There are a lot of rumors out there um, that we continue to um, try to debunk uh, and will fail because rumors travel faster than we can. Um, and our goal is to have the educational experience be normal, as normalized as possible. That students come to school, they see familiar faces, they learn the primary content, uh, and they go home happy, engaged students. And that's really our focus. It does mean curtailing things that happen after school. Mm. Um, it does mean curtailing some things that were planned for during school. Uh, the governor is very clear in his recommendations today when he declared the state of emergency. Really, I and mean, this letter was written before the governor's speech, we just added the thing about the governor you know, de declaring that, but the staff email had went out before with all the same content. Um, I'm in touch with the health department all the time. Um, Northampton's in a very similar boat. They had the same challenging decision on their musical um, mm -hmm. that we had. One undetermined thing is athletics and spring sports. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for the MIAA to come out with their thoughts about it. Um, you can see that at the college level, people are all over the map. The Ivy League just canceled their uh, men's and women's basketball tournament, and then you have other tournaments happening with fans there, and other tournaments happening without March. fans, and Italy just canceled Series A, their their primary <laughs> soccer league, they were happening without fans, and they've canceled it. What about March Madness? 
That'll be a different matter. So um, <laughs> I, for the NCAA to manage, but we, we are looking, uh, I know tomorrow there's a conference call with the State Department of Public Health and people like um, Jill Consolino, our nurse manager, and Julie Fetterman. Are, um, so I think they're going to have some real clear recommendations mm -hmm. for spring sports. But it is something that I know I've got a lot of questions about this afternoon, even though we put in the letter, we're looking for more guidance and information. Uh, it's, it's high on people's list. Um, I know Amherst College canceled sports, but that's a little different because the students won't literally be there um, for much of the spring anyway. And so um, it's, it's this emerging situation. It changes by the day. And our goal throughout has been to give consistent, updated information. And consistent means what is happening right now. And that's the hard thing for the community, and it's a hard thing for us, is what consistent meant yesterday felt different than what it means today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not clear what consistent is going to mean next week. I could be really optimistic and say a month from now we can relax a lot of these rules. I don't know if it's trending in that direction, hmm. right, to be very blunt. Um, it's not trending in that direction. So I can remain optimistic that, like us, many other organizations are taking really strong measures to uh, control um, this crisis. Um, I think they're all measures that um, are met with um, sincerity and effort. I can't guarantee that it's going to that coronavirus and COVID-19 won't come up in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing active planning for that as well, uh, working with the health department, um, working with actually that's where Desi sort of comes in and they've given some guidance. Um, but what we saw today as an example is we saw Arlington, Massachusetts, which had the first case of confirmed, I believe confirmed COVID-19 of a student choose not to cancel school. Hmm. And then we had another community closer to where we live who had a relative as, of a substitute teacher um, be self-quarantined, not confirmed with the illness, and they canceled school at one of the elementary schools. And then we have a school in the Berkshires that had uh, one confirmed case in their town, and they canceled school for a week. And the thing I want to express to you is that's not a critique of any of those three districts. There is a real lack of clarity and guidance coming mm -hmm. from any agency, and the advice we continue to receive is work with your local board of health to make those determinations. And so the reason you're seeing such disparity within our state, and then I'm from New York, talk about disparity <laughs> of, of how people are responding, it's, it's, it's even wider because um, the out outbreak is much more significant uh, in that area. And so uh, the thing we know is that the best thing we can do is communicate exactly what we're doing exactly why we're doing it and the guidance we're getting. And we can't control other districts. We can't control what's happening in New York State or Seattle um, or the Bay Area or, frankly, what's happening in Northampton or Hadley or West Springfield or Arlington. Uh, but we can listen to our community. Uh, we can make interest that the experts in our community have been recommending to us. I'm optimistic that as the governor has declared a state of emergency, there will be more clear guidance coming from the state level. But I want to be clear, it's not here yet. Hmm. So that was really long-winded, but it's an important issue that um, mm -hmm. is, is dominating what we're doing on a moment-to-moment, day-to-day basis. I should say also, I'm sorry, the last thing, I promise, but that there, we do have a screening group, or, or not screening group, excuse me, we have a steering group that's meeting uh, on a weekly basis at least that includes Mr. Jones, an elementary principal rep, uh, central office staff, you know, family center, or special ed. So as we're developing our processes, and Jerry Champagne from an IS, because that's pretty critical, uh, we have a steering group that meets on a routine basis to review the new information. We're obviously doing more than just meeting on a weekly basis, but we do have a steering group that uh, allows us for building-based leaders as well as district leaders to be communicating and talking about what people are hearing and what our next steps are. Okay. Now Thank I'll you. stop. I'm sure there's um, lots of questions or comments, so let's start with Mr. Menino. I'm a little confused. Um, you said uh, there was no site, no definitive cases of virus in the valley, but yet you indicated there were scattered uh, cases or across the state. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that the tests are not available. Where are these? How many people have been tested? I mean, until we know how many people have been tested, how do we know whether it's here or not? So right now there's, and, and if you want to jump in, you may be closer to this than me. I can. I, I'll let you go first. Sure. If I can so there's what's called presumed cases. So those are um, two categories. One are cases where um, the symptoms fit and people have traveled to places that have large amounts of, relatively large amounts of, of COVID-19. Or they were in, for instance, like in Massachusetts, where seven-ninths of, you know, 
So almost 80% are stemming from one particular employer called Biogen mm -hmm. um, and particular meetings that happened at Biogen. Mm -hmm. And so when people have come up with symptoms that could be flu, could be COVID-19, the medical professionals are looking at, well, what are the risk factors and, and might it be COVID-19? So right now we're doing a lot of presumed uh, pieces. Uh, we won't know, and, and the testing is getting, my understanding is testing is getting better. Still not great, but getting better is being more readily available. Um, it's still not perfect, um, but people look at the risk factors and try to make their best assumptions right now of what's flu, what's COVID-19 based on symptoms, but also based on context. But Ms. Spitzer knows more than me, so she probably could. Well, I'm not a <laughs> clinician, but I do work at, um, in a medical environment. So. I think you're right on, and I think you're right to point out that we <coughs> tests Bless have you. not been readily available, and it's a problem. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Mr. Denley? So uh, we certainly can't predict the future. Um, but one obvious question that is going to be on every parent and student's mind is there exists the possibility that schools could close, mm -hmm. that, our, that we could close our public schools. Um, so I guess just my general question is um, how are we preparing about how that would get communicated? Because mm -hmm. that's just about the biggest kind of thing we could communicate. Um, and, and what preparations are we, are we are currently underway to, to prepare for that possibility? Um, and, you know, and the reason I ask about that is um, I would imagine that the effectiveness or not of uh, you know, educationally of, of what would happen after we close school would depend to a degree on, on what we did to prepare, and, and it seems like quite the challenge, particularly the, the younger you go with the grades. Um, it's, you know, you, um, you know, we hear about colleges closing and just, you know, they, they just switch to online. It's, it's pretty hard to have an online first grade class in an educationally appropriate manner. So just uh, any thoughts across the gamut on that? Sure, so uh, the first thing that we learned today with the state of emergency is that the state would only make students and staff make up days up into 185 days. So at the region, that's one more day than they've currently had snow days. And at the elementary level, that's two more days than they currently have snow days. Um, so in terms of literally making up the days, it wouldn't be like, you know, for people who are like, we're going to be in school on July 4th, right? I mean, the school year wouldn't extend uh, much beyond where it currently is. Uh, it's not fully answering your question. I, I promise I'll get back to it. The other thing they had is that uh, there is an accountability measure that the state has tracking for chronic attendance challenges, and they've stopped doing that as of March 2nd. So in other words, if there are absences in the school beyond March 2nd, they're not attuned to the accountability measures that students, schools have. Getting more specifically to your question, uh, we've looked at multiple scenarios. So we sent out a survey this afternoon specific to high school faculty, uh, trying to ascertain in terms of, you know, distance learning or that, that's what we're calling it, distance learning. Uh, what are some of the barriers? Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, one of our major concerns about distance learning is students with special needs and what that looks like. We called into DESE. Um, their answer was telling us that was a really good question. Um, <laughs> and that if we come up with something, they'd be curious to look at it. Um, so we're, when I say we're not getting support, I think they're really busy there. I'm not trying to belittle Desi at all. They, they called us back in the midst of this, and it was a pretty high-level person who called us back. Um, so we're trying to collect that data. If the data shows that we should pursue it more, then we would survey high school students, because um, not every high school student has. Um, Internet access, we're looking at mobile hotspots and purchasing some of those if we would need to. Uh, one of the data points that we already received is how many students at the high school, if school ended today, would have enough credits to graduate if nothing else mm -hmm. happened. Like we didn't relax rules. And I believe this, it was about, yeah, there was 3% of students who have enough credits to graduate today who are, who are 12th grade students. So that is one of the reasons we're looking at, particularly at the high school, some is the age of students and applicability of curriculum and, and ease of that. Some is that we want students, whether they're walking across in a, a real stage or a virtual stage, who knows what it'll look like in June, right? Hopefully we'll be in better shape. Um, we wanna get students, make sure students get there. And so that's why we're starting with the high school to do this exploration. We were really clear in our email that we weren't committed to doing this if we have a long-term closure, but we're trying to gather and ascertain what are the barriers um, and what would work for all students, what would work for some students, and what would be compensatory services we might owe. 
uh, and we may have to go down that road. So we had, uh, it was pretty amazing. I mean, I haven't talked to, Mr. Jones and I talked about a lot of things today, so this was not one of them, but we sent that survey out at 2.30, something like that, um, and we already had um, 20, 30 responses when I checked uh, about 4 o'clock. And so we want to give people a day or two to respond to that. And Mr. Champagne, Mr. Sheen, and I are sort of the kind of steering committee on that and working with Mr. Jones. Um, and we're going to ask a different set of questions likely to, to high school students to understand what some of their challenges would be in that scenario. We're not looking at it at the pre-K to 8 level, uh, first of all, because the credit recovery piece isn't so huge, but also because the applicability and, and um, just the readiness of students to use that medium, I think is, we really question the educational effectiveness of doing that. Um, so we are trying to prepare as best we can, as particularly as it relates to the high school. At the other levels, we're looking at some of our existing products like Sora. So at the elementary level, Sora goes through our wonderful librarians, but there are ways for students to continue reading, um, and even young students to continue with read alouds that Sora has. It's an online program that students can use. Uh, and perhaps how can we offer reading comprehension to other questions with that? It's everyday math, our math program does have an online component, uh, but we're not imagining like a big Google Hangout where there's a formal lesson taught uh, in the same way that we can imagine that potentially happening at the high school level. Uh, I want to be honest, my friends at higher ed level have said that there's no easy fix on that either. Yeah. That while colleges are going down that road, and there's no critique here, uh, I, don't, I want to dispel anyone here or in the public that this is, that I'm hearing anything other than, wow, we have a lot of learning to do in a short mm -hmm. amount of time, and you know, and, and again, that's not critiquing colleges' decisions to make whatever decisions they make. Uh, but just because you hear people are going to doesn't mean there aren't bumps in the road mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of challenges. And 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 place like uh, Amherst College, for instance. Uh, there are some schools in the western part of the country where staff have been able to come in and use equipment in the school while students aren't there. So you have a couple different scenarios. You have the distance learning scenario where everyone's not at school, and then you have a distance learning scenario where staff are at school but students aren't. So we're trying to plan through all of those. Um, but at the current time, um, a lot of our work has been if there was a parent who was uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, what would we do and what if there's a student? And I can't give you a clear answer because the number of contextual pieces are huge. Does a student have siblings? Is the parent been in multiple schools? Are, they, are there other high-risk factors? Um, the, the matrix of decision-making is really complex on that, but it's a matrix we're diving into with the support of the town. I also want to note that uh, later this week, the town is getting together with all departments and actually institutions uh, that are in the town, like higher education, to talk through our approach more generally. Um, I'm trying to work with Jill Consolino, our nurse manager, the town manager, and the um, Julie Fetterman um, to maybe do, and this is going to sound really awkward perhaps, but like a Facebook Live event this week, because what we don't want to do is have a forum and have 100 people come, right? Like that's <laughs> not what we're trying to do. At the same time, there's so much uh, misinformation and people are so hungry for accurate information that we're trying to figure out a, a vehicle or a mechanism to be able to communicate to large groups of people that's live, that can take live questions. Because uh, if we just did like an Amherst Media thing, it, 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 you can't, I mean, maybe we could do a call in, but it feels one step removed from, uh, and we have all sorts of concerns about doing it on Facebook just because of other things about Facebook. But uh, right now, you know, that's the best thinking as of 6, 7.25 tonight uh, about trying to get uh, an organized event in the next week or two where we could be communicating with the public uh, and the public can be communicating with us in a live active way. So details to come on that and I'll share that. But uh, what we know is that it's an evolving situation that there'll be a gap in time from the moment we plan it to when it happens and information will change. Uh, and that's why we have an active link on our website specifically for this. So you can see the chronology of communication as well as active other resources. Sorry, that was long winded as well. But this is what this is what everyone's doing for the last you know 48 hours in particular. Um, Everything else has sort of fallen off by the wayside because this has been our real focus around student, sa student and staff safety. And then I, I want to just loop back before Ms. Spitzer asks a question to remind everyone with something I said at the beginning because I, I can't stress it enough that um, we can't just think of the average healthy person in our community. We have to think about the vulnerable students, the vulnerable staff, the, the students and staff with vulnerable family members. The elderly. Including the elderly, as is, 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 there's been a lot of guidance on that front. And so um, when the health department's making their decisions, as hard as they are, and they're as painful as they are, I mean, that's, 
really painful today to tell people they can't go on field trips and musical production that students have been working and staff have tremendously hard on can't go on as planned and that's why we're trying to think of creative solutions it's for the public health reasons it's and and that's just really hard i met with this morning with the senegal gambian scholars which i think i might have mentioned earlier that we we were not doing international travel uh, as per recommendations from the mass department of public health as well as the governor um, students were wonderful in understanding it they rescheduled for fall and we'll keep our fingers crossed that this is not still an issue in fall um, but i really want to thank the community because the community certainly is not shy at expressing its viewpoint as they should should be um, uh, or should not be shy. Um, at the same time, the understanding of the larger health issues, uh, I feel like it's been incredibly well understood by the larger community. Um, and while we can disagree on certain steps, uh, there's been a really concern of fellow person in our community and beyond that has been really, and, and I don't use this word lightly, heartwarming, heartwarming to see. Like the emails I've gotten that have, have been complaints have said, I know you're doing this for these reasons. Have you thought of, right? And, and everyone's starting from that frame of understanding that this, is, this situation is larger than the Amherst Regional Public Schools. It's larger than any of us. Um, so I just really want to thank the community for that, frame, that viewpoint and framing. Mm -hmm. Ms. Spitzer? Um, I just had two follow-up yep. questions. Um, one is I'm assuming all of our like, teachers have paid sick time off, but what about like substitutes or folks who may be not full-time employees with union contracts? Um, are we doing anything to kind of make it less financially or less stressful for them to call in sick? Mm -hmm. So it's a good point, and I can get back to you. Ms. Cunningham couldn't be here tonight, and she's mm -hmm. been managing a lot of the HR personnel side, so I can't say specifically. Okay. Um, but we have not been – subs have been very active the last couple of days. You know, mm -hmm. as we once we put out, please stay home when you're sick. Um, I know that's a different question because you're asking about what if the subs are sick. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, because I yeah. feel like if you have paid sick time, which I'm assuming our yes, unionized yeah, yeah. employees do, which is yeah. I think something everybody should have, um, it's it's easier for you to call out. But I'm assuming there are people who might be working in our schools who may not have that kind of that are at um, will employees. Yeah, yeah, and and so it may be harder for them to turn down a day subbing if they're sick. Or yeah. and I don't know about the subs, but. It's just something I'm concerned about in general. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, and then my other question is, I, I know there are a lot of kids in our schools who are food insecure, and yeah. in the event that we were to close, I'm just curious about how we thought through, like, would we get the Berkshire food truck <laughs> traveling maybe to communities yeah. where there would be more? I, I don't know. I'm just curious about if there's been planning around that, because it seems like a big there's issue. There's been some. So one of the things that, we're, and we're equally concerned about that, um, I know some communities in California have like gotten approval from the state to be able to do food truck deliveries. There's been some current concerns expressed locally about what that would look like. Are we using the same kitchen that we're shutting down and, and sanitizing? And what about staff? We're going house to house um, yeah. mm -hmm. to do that. Um, one of the things that we have been in touch with is other community agencies like the Survival Center mm -hmm. that in the case, um, are there other existing mechanisms that could be expanded in the community for that instead of necessarily replacing what we're doing uh, because sort of some of the guidance we've gotten is a little different than what I've seen in California around doing that ourselves versus um, partnering with community agencies around that. And, I, and, and I, I'm glad you bring that up because there are real financial ramifications. I don't mean of the food, but it, it just dawned on me to say of all the cleaning, all the products we're buying, um, and when we get to the end of third quarter budget mm -hmm. and we get into fourth quarter, we're going to have to have that, some active conversations about that. If we indeed have to close school, that's going to have uh, both health, mm -hmm. safety, food security, but also have financial ramifications for our district as well. Um, and we're going to do the right thing by kids because that's mm -hmm. what we do, and we're going to follow the directives from the public health department because that's they're the experts in the area um, but none of those things are free and uh, I want to be really clear about that as well so I have one um, yeah. a smaller question um, but going back to um, the, the small behaviors I think it was in the first letter the yeah. small behaviors that, that we can be doing to keep ourselves healthy and safe um, and and the hand washing being one and you mentioned not wanting to, we can't buy lots and lots of um, hand sanitizer, but I do, what are we doing in the schools, particularly in the high school and the middle school, to support um, students washing hands before, before mealtime? Yeah. Yeah, so we haven't, it's hard to mandate that for 950 students um, at the high school, but there's been broad encouragement around that um, that Mr. Jones and I have spoken about. 
um, and reminders around that. Um, much like anyone else, you know, it's hard to force those behaviors on students. I really think that's where some of Mr. Sheehan's um, lessons that were sent out this afternoon to high school faculty, because I've heard from some of the high school faculty, and they're pretty compelling about, I mean, they're frankly, you know, if someone isn't concerned, they, they would get concerned with some of the videos around how infections grow over time. And so I think the best thing we can do at the high school level is the social norms piece of, you know, what is the social norm and why are we encouraging, not just saying wash your hands, but actually to see the visual of infections growing over time in different areas. That's the best kind of intervention that I believe for at the high school level we can do. Um, for those of you who have adolescent students or adolescent children, you'll know that just telling them five times is much less helpful than showing them the impact that it has, um, both hand washing but also um, how, the, how the infection grows. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've, again, I never mean to put you on the spot. I just want to make sure you're invited to jump in if you'd like to. And Mr. Jones, I don't know if there's anything you want to, again, not that you have to, but anything you want to add that I'm missing. No, I think you, uh, you hit the spot, but being in the cafeteria, I've seen students use the hand sanitizers, and we have put more up in the building. Yep. Uh, various parts of the building, the students have noticed it and are utilizing it. Yeah. At the high school, we just, we don't have the capacity for 950 students to wash their hands for 20 seconds that quickly before lunch, and <laughs> so we do have to make adjustments, and the way OSHA laws work is within reason. And so at the elementary level, we do have the capacity for every student to wash their hand for 20 seconds. At the high school, it's just it's just frankly not feasible in every location, particularly near the cafeteria, and that's why we've we've done that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, well, thank you. And and now we we're caught up to our. Uh, I told you time. I would slow us down. Um, <laughs> but but I think just I'll end by saying we'll just need to keep talking about this. This this is not going away. Um, it's not going away as a public health issue. It's not going away as an area of public concern. Um, and I know, based on your questions tonight, it's not going away as a school committee concern and certainly not going away as, as a concern I have. Um, and adjusting to a different flow um, in terms of field trips, other matters, is going to be a real adjustment. I mean, uh, I'll just say that meeting with my district directors who are saying, you mean I can't pull all the counselors from the district together at the same time? And I was like, no, you can't. You can meet with the high school counselors. You can meet with the middle school counselors. You can meet with the, you know. Um, so we are going to have to readjust our norms around how we do business. Um, I think it will frankly affect um, central office uh, and district staff a little more than at the building level um, because really what we're, we're doing is building, the work's going to happen much more at the building level than pulling groups of people together. Uh, is going to slow down some district work as well. I mean, I will say the grade span advisory, if not for COVID-19, I probably would have been ready to present something tonight. I am not ready to present something tonight, and um, the time and energy and the bandwidth that it's taken um, is warranted, and it, there, there's a finite amount of things that anyone can work on at once, and this has been a key, um, key thing for all of us to be uh, learning about as we go. Yeah, great, thank you. Thanks. Um, so moving on to our next item, which is the budget vote. Um, <coughs> I do not have it. But sure. There we go. This is not a terribly exciting uh, PowerPoint presentation because it's basically I'm all excited. the slides are exactly the same as what you've seen recently. There's just fewer of them. So well, this, my page has a little bit of difference. It adds cuts. Yeah, there is. There are a couple of changes, but but mostly it's uh, pretty much exactly what you've seen. And can I just frame this that um, while the slides you have in your packet, there's a page that Mr. Slaughter, Dr. Slaughter, and I made of motions. If you remember in the past, regional motions around budget tend to be for the long and long and tooth. Um, and so we'll go through it, but what we're going to come back to is the motions, um, the first essentially four motions that are on um, the pages that follow some of the communication about uh, the coronavirus. So I just want to orient folks that there's motions and then there's the slides. Right. 
And so, the, yeah, the motions are wordy because the state and you know requires us to be wordy in its particular language. But um, if we could, uh, just to take it through the slide deck a little bit, if we could. And, and so the first one we'll have here is the revenue budget. Um, so what we have here is is uh, some history involved, but also uh, and some projection out into future years. But more importantly is the column that says FY21 proposed. Um, and again, the, the sort of bottom line number of $32,639,531 has not changed, I don't believe, since last time. Um, what that column represents from an assessment method is to utilize, uh, we've talked about a variety of different methodologies, but the 45% um, uh, how do I say that? Uh, EQV methodology. Um, so part of it's based on our, our sort of classic model, part of it's based upon our, our, our use of uh, EQV to, to, to set the uh, assessment amounts, uh, but it is using that 45% uh, uh, percentage as opposed to 50 or 40 or 30 or anyway. And that's um, in the packet at the end of this presentation. We just put that, um, that all the different methods on there so you would be able to track that we're talking about the 45% method um, after some of the adjustments that were done early in February. Um, so if there was any questions about it, we mm -hmm. wanted you to have accurate information of what the assessments were to each member community. I am correct that the has been no agreement yet from the four towns on the assessment method. So I, that is true. We did not have another four town meeting, but I would say that I've received positive feedback from members of the communities about the 45% method with the adjusted numbers that you have in the packet. Mm -hmm. We'll never know, as you know, till we get to town meeting and town <laughs> council, how it goes, particularly town meeting. Um, in, in some of our communities, um, there sometimes is a gap between what elected officials in the communities perhaps prefer. But um, people who were against seemingly every method at the last four town meeting have called me to tell me that they feel like this is fair and they can support this at their town meeting, and the towns will vote how they vote. Mm -hmm. You know, and same with the Amherst Town Council will vote how it votes. I don't want to preclude that. It's just a little different process with the town council than it is at a town meeting. Okay. Right. All right. So, um, again, it, the changes in this, uh, so I'll, I'll point out a couple of things that you might not have seen. We changed the transportation reimbursement up to 800000 We have some better numbers relative to uh, sort of performance by the state this year. So that's gone up a little bit. That reduced the burden across the board for everyone. Um, the, um, I'm trying to think of any, any other changes. That's the primary one on this, on this slide. And so I think that that takes care of that. And if we switch to the next slide, we have a, the uh, ultra condensed version of the expense budget. Um, so we have our salaries uh, coming in over, you know, it just shy of $18 million with uh, some increase in, in in price or or, or uh, a somewhat more significant increase from a year-to-year -year standpoint for substitutes, and that's primarily driven by the change to, to minimum wage, uh, that we, we want to accommodate that, and so that causes us to put about a 5% increase in our in our substitute line. Um, our expense accounts, which carry in, you know, uh, a variety of expenses, but in particular, uh, some of the larger ones are, are things like our health insurance costs are in there. Um, and so again, those those are uh, in place. Uh, so that overall change on 11th services uh, standpoint is is at two and a half percent overall. Um, we have a series of additions and reductions, which we'll show you on the next slide, and that brings it it down uh, to the budget that is the total we'll we'll ask you to vote on tonight. And you can see uh, year over year, it's a 1.47 percent increase over last year's budget or the current year's budget, I should say. Um, Again, not a wild set of changes from, from what we looked at before relative to, to the expenses that we've been looking at for the, for the coming year. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I'll actually defer to you to go through sure. this uh, part. So I'm only going to talk about a couple of these, and I'll take questions for any, but uh, I'll talk about the ones that I've, uh, one that's, um, small one that's new, but others that there were questions about last time. So alternative funding source, to be really clear, that's uh, UMass, based on the agreement with the university. And the district, um, and then through the town of Amherst that was announced maybe two weeks ago, something like that. Um, and the regional share of that, which is $15,000, which we'll receive both this fiscal year, the current one, um, next one, and the one after, and then it'll have to be renegotiated. 
Um, one thing that you haven't seen before, um, unless you've been in the Amherst School Committee, is because uh, it's connected, is a coordinated environmental action analysis. So this is working with both the town of Amherst, the Amherst Public Schools, the regional share is a little smaller given our budget constraints, to have uh, a firmer person work with us about energy improvements and to work with us not on the large scale projects like on capital, but our routine energy efficiency, um, someone with expertise and pulling the money both from the regional budget, the Amherst budget, and the town, we feel like it's sufficient for someone to be working with us on that. The next one I'd like to speak to is the world language cut. Um, frankly, it should be termed a little differently, um, and there, I'll explain why. And so uh, we've had a declining number, we have a declining enrollment at our secondary level, and as a result, we've had a declining enrollment in French. And so this year, for instance, at the high school, we have uh, two French teachers teaching one study hall each because there wasn't a need for them to teach five classes based on the current enrollment. So what this really is, is reducing by point four. It's taking away two study halls from the high school that were added because we didn't have enough student demand to fill a full complement of French courses. Uh. So there is some personnel pieces that we're working through of how to support staff. From a student perspective, it's reducing study halls that were unanticipated the number of study halls we were able to offer this year. It's not actually reducing a world language section in any language. What are those French teachers doing if they're not covering the study hall? So that's what we're working through with the French teachers and because it's pretty identifiable, um, you know, HR, the principal, and the department head are working through some alternatives uh, around how to perhaps cover other classes or other languages or working with staff to become lang licensed in more than one la world language, which is not atypical. Uh, but that's an active conversation that uh, human resources is leading with staff. Uh, but from a budgetary perspective, it's essentially cutting two study halls, uh, which we didn't anticipate having because all that played out after the budget last spring when students enrolled and we looked at the court class sizes uh, and what the needs were. The last one, which I haven't been that, uh, I want to be a little more clear about, um, much of this comes from revising the middle school administrative model. So right now we have a co-principalship, which as I, I think we shared last year is has an additional expense. Uh, we're currently searching for a principal right now, and that search is ongoing. And that principal will hire an assistant principal. Uh, going back to the school year, assistant principal that the middle schools typically had over the last six or seven years. And so there's significant savings from that model change. Um, so there's some other savings around the edges, but that's the primary part of the savings for that um, administrative reduction. And I think that's, I'll open to any questions on this list, but that's what I wanted to add from where we were last time. Mr. Jennings. So uh, two questions. One on the grade six to 12 math curriculum training and support. So we've talked about this a little bit the last couple mm -hmm. of meetings yeah. and um, my understanding from a couple of meetings ago was if, if we had the budget, then the appropriate educationally preferred level of that position would be 0.8 FTE. Is that, F, F, given the, the, the year of the implementation, is that correct? It is. I want to be clear that when I said 0.8, I'm talking about K to, or 6 to 12. Mm -hmm. So there's a regional budget, so right now it's funded at 0.4 from the region and 0.2 at the elementary level, so it's funded at 0.6, and I think if we were able to find a way, um, I think for that extra year, I think the implementation has went smoothly because of that position, um, and I'd like to fade it a little slower than what we're being forced to, to do. Mr. Um, Jemmy? Yes, yeah, so, my, so I'll get back to that um, later. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the second question is on the, the coordinated environmental action analysis. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Because so this is like the third or fourth environmental slash green slash renewable energy item that has come across our deck. And right. I, I constantly struggle with, on the one hand, you know, I, I support the principle, you right. know, the, the, the ideal. And, and I'm grateful to live in a town where we, we in a region where we don't have the argument about, you know, is this a crisis? Right. Should we be dealing with it? No, and yet we have fiscal scarcity. So, so to me, the the question ultimately comes down to with a lot of these things is this is the same question: How do we get the most carbon reduction bang right. for a limited resource buck? And and I feel bad questioning investments in specific things again and again yeah. when I can't answer that question. And this seems like a pretty small amount. So I'm just wondering about what the total is with the other towns um, and, and and what the scope is. 
Right. So I can't answer the question for what the town's contributing because I don't think they've presented their budget. I'm looking at town councilor right now, but I don't think the town has presented their budget currently. Um, for, for the schools, um, combined between the Amherst and region, and I'm a little foggy on Amherst, um, I want to say it was more like $5,000, but I'd have to go back and loop back and double check. But I think the idea is that when we have questions, when our facilities director has questions, that the same ones you just asked, what's the most bang for our buck? We have this list of projects that I'd like to do, that there's a someone who can answer those questions and do that analysis and support that work. It's not a replacement for capital investments in longer term studies, um, but there are routine day-to-day -day things that come up all the time. Some of them don't even get discussed more broadly at school committee because they're it within the facilities budget. And our facilities director, I mean, frankly, drives an electric car. He's very invested in green technology, and yet uh, he's also got a day job. And so the idea is to have someone who can help support us in those decision-making uh, matrices about what's the most bang for our buck. Here's five different ways we can go. Someone with a background experience who can support us in that way. Um, you know, when I talked about with the town manager, I think he's supportive of supporting that and that there are no shortage of people who can support us on that with people with background experience and, and hard science data knowledge, not necessarily just what um, feels like a good idea to someone like me who's very much a novice at this. So that's, that's the best I can offer okay. at the moment. So I think it's still in development. You can hear that in the, the way I described it. Okay. but. Um, we really want to get the ball rolling with this and, and not have it just be capital projects that are big, but also our routine practices. Thank you. Mr. Menino? A minor point has nothing to do with the uh, budget. Could you consider using the current logo for the Pelham Elementary School? I will work on getting the new logo in okay. place. I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> it's important. It's a tell. borrowed slide deck uh, template. I understand. It's just a comment. Yeah. I, I use it as often as I can. Okay. Ms. Spitzer? I, I just want to say I'm, I'm happy to see that we are th thinking big picture about um, how we can be more sustainable or environmentally friendly. I'm wondering, too, if there's an opportunity um, to at the end of the, just to get buy-in from the, some of the other stakeholders. So it seems like before we actually, um, you know, engage with this person, or me, I'm not sure what point in time, but at some point I think it would be really great to like harness the energy from the students who are doing the water bottle filtration right. and the energy from other right. organizations and stakeholders in our community to kind of have a little bit of um, a say in what they find, or, or at least find a way to share that. Um, hopefully we'll inform when we're not dealing with COVID-19 or something like that. Yeah. But it just seems like it, it would be nice to, to bring it together with the folks in the community who are who are really invested in this, because we are lucky to have a lot of people That's right. who are. I fully agree. Thanks. Okay. We want to move to capital. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the capital projects list uh, is uh, is not different from what you've last seen, but what I did want to point out to you on this uh, on this slide in particular, because it has color, um, there are projects that are funded from other revenue sources. Um, for example, the pool infrastructure improvements of $10,000, there's a revolving fund, so folks that use the pool pay in a fee. We collect that into a revolving fund that we use for the purposes of maintaining our pool. Uh, likewise, with the uh, uh, summit, or the S Southeast Campus renovations, that should say summit really, but um, and with the, um, on the, on the far right there, uh, field improvements, we have $200,000. I've been out at several community preservation committee meetings. Uh, I was in Leverett just the other day. I'll be in Chutesbury on Thursday. Uh, you know, seeking their approval and they're, they're putting it to the, to the townspeople to use CPA funds to provide that, uh, support to get our fields project moving forward. Uh, and then the parking access and, and, Repaving that $30,000, again, we collect a small number of fees from students for parking. We put that into a revolving fund that we use to repair those. And so those are all, you know, uh, identified sources for those. The remainder of those will be, the, of the projects that are there are, are scheduled to be borrowing. And so there's 
uh, an appropriate assessment to each of the member towns uh, for that total of uh, 425,000 in total. Um, we'll borrow it probably next year. We will not see those hit the books from the standpoint of uh, assessment dollars needed from the communities until fiscal 22. Um, so the assessment amounts for capital that you will see uh, will be for projects we've already done or in the process of finishing as we speak. Um, and recently we went to the, to the, to the, not the bond market, but the band market uh, to borrow. The, the, the band is a stand for band bond authorization note. It's a short term borrowing that you do. Um, you can kind of continue to do that multiple times if you don't want to actually bond something. Um, we got a very nice rate of 1.54% on the band for this year. And so, uh, you know, if we get to a place where, we, for example, uh, if the opportunity to, to uh, take on the middle school roof project comes to fruition this year, we may then bond it and roll in the band into the bond. So there's a lot of different moving pieces on this. Uh, but nonetheless, um, this will be new uh, borrowing that we will do probably in fiscal 21 being assessed, uh, beginning to be assessed in, in fiscal 22. Um, but the amounts that you'll see, uh, which I think maybe on the next slide, I'm, I'm maybe not, I don't remember if I had another slide, um, but certainly in the motions have the actual assessments to the member towns. Um, and that set of assessments is based on the current uh, borrowing. So we had projections probably in the fall, which were just a smidge higher because we didn't know what we were going to borrow at. So tiny bit smaller, not wildly smaller, but a little bit smaller than what you may have seen in November when Mr. Mangano may have presented those to you. And I'm happy to answer questions as best I can about any of the particular projects, um, if you have any of those right. as well. I want to note that this, this isn't, this has all been shared with the towns and it's not a change yes. from right. prior presentations. Okay. Sorry, you, may, you said that in your own way, but I just want to be super clear about it. Nice to answer. Um, Dr. Slaughter, about the $200,000 for the, the study for the grounds, if we don't get the $200,000 altogether from the towns, what's the next plan? So, I've answered this at every CP. C or CPAC meeting and we'll continue to answer this question, which is fine. It's a, 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 a you know, eminently appropriate question to ask because, you know, um, different towns will make different decisions mm -hmm. potentially about this. Um, so first and foremost is that $200,000 is not likely, depending on a series of choices you guys will make probably in the next six months or so mm -hmm. or eight months, uh, will not likely cover all of the design and engineering necessary to go to construction plans. So it'll be part of that. Mm -hmm. um, if we get some portion of the 200,000, then we will scale our first phase of design and engineering based on what we get. Okay. Um, and then we'll craft a new plan based on where okay. we're at at that point. Um, right. But, you know, I fully, and I'll say this now, and I've said it to each of the meetings, I you know, fully respect each town's decision-making process around that and what they feel is best for their community and what they can afford or not afford. Nice thing about the CPA money is that it's got some state funding match that helps reduce the immediate burden on taxpayers in your community and yet still gets okay. us uh, recreation facilities. There's lots of concerns because it physically sits inside the confines of the town of Amherst and I appreciate that, but mm -hmm. it's owned by each of the four communities so, and and the public has access to it so we, we, we're not going to deny people access to those fields once they're, once they're uh, updated to, the, mm -hmm. to a new uh, status. So it's not a straightforward, easy question. I think everybody's, okay. each town will evaluate and make their boy, vote count when okay. go to town meeting or town council. But basically what you're saying is that we would just scale back the initial planning process if we had to. That's right. Okay. That's right. Because we, we haven't right. voted and there isn't a line in here for any other monies from, right. from uh, our usual capital process okay. for that. So. All right. Thank you. Mr. Demling? I just want to briefly comment that um, it, it might seem strange that we're going through the assessment method and the capital and the budget without a lot of... Uh, you know, um, lively questions, but uh, so if you're, you know, I feel like this is one of those regional topics where it's the last step in a very long process, and you know, the reason is because we've been meeting on this since last fall, and we've had many lively discussions yes. about capital and assessment method and budget, and uh, so, um, 
you know, not that we're completely exhausted, but uh, you know, it is. It, I think so. Sometimes you know, it can be a little funny if you're watching uh, from the from the public's point of view for the first time that all this stuff just sort of goes by in 15 minutes, and then we right. uh, that it's it's actually uh, it's been it's been a long road. Right. <laughs> the the uh, the flash was earlier, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as far as the the presentations and the information and that sort of stuff was was earlier and it, it is it's a long process it's you know it's a fairly complicated process so it, it takes a number of meetings to sort of paint the picture and and get feedback and and negotiate the limitations and opportunities that are available so it does seem rather anticlimactic to me at this point but at the same time it's good to be here too <laughs> <laughs> at least from my perspective it is yeah. uh, questions is this the end? Yeah, I'm sorry. Is this the end? Yes. Mr. Jeffrey. So um, I'm inclined to approve the budget with the exception of changing the FTE of the math curriculum support, cut from 0.6 to 0.8, uh, and then offsetting that with a corresponding reduction in what we contribute to the special ed stabilization fund. So if we, if my math is right, mm -hmm. please correct me if it's not, uh, that would be 13000 and so the contribution to the Special Ed Stabilization Fund would be 85 instead of 98. And then we, we would kick the FTE of the curriculum support up to 0 0.8. And you know, so the reason I say this is because, um, I mean, I think I, I get the, the need to, to get that fund up, the Special Ed Stabilization Fund. So it's not, a, a, um, it's not without cost to, to re, refill that to, to 0.8 FTE. But um, you know, I think back about what we've done with math curriculum over the years at the region. Uh, and depending on how you count, this has been almost an eight-year process, uh, depending where you start the finish line from the, from the middle school, the high school, and flex, and IMP, and, and all that. And uh, it just has so many touch points with so many of the subgroups that we talk about all the time. You know, special ed, this came up at the CPAC meeting. Um, we had a good discussion about it as well. Um, and I just feel like if, you know, we, we feel like it's, it's, it is going well, and we have confidence that this is a, a resource that's going to um, solidify this for you know for the coming many years that it's it's worthwhile you know so long as as the superintendent didn't feel like that level of reduction in the stabilization fund that thirteen thousand wasn't well, it wasn't such a negative impact and so you know I, I guess I'd like to hear a mm -hmm. uh, point of view on that um, but that's 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 the only change that I would, I would like us to consider Definitely. I'd be amenable to that change um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to go much below. I wouldn't want to go below 85,000. You know, our goal was to fund special ed stabilization at the regional level, where if a student came in who was a residential, who would uh, need special needs, required residential um, support, that we'd be able to fund that. Uh, I don't think the $13,000 is going to make or break that piece. Uh, we start going below 85, then I start getting concerned that we're not committed to funding that. Um, I think I agree with Mr. Dunling's point about the value of the support of the math implementation, that if that's not done well, it's no matter how great our curriculum is, it's all about the implementation, and that support's been really incredibly value, valuable in making this year be a smooth one, even though it's a, kind of a very quick process. Um, so I'm amenable to that, if the committee um, so chooses. If I may. So just to uh, paint the picture a little bit for you, um, so we've been able to contribute to that stabilization fund both in fiscal 19 and fiscal 20, $98,000. So the current balance is a little over 196000 There's a wee bit of interest in there. Um, and so the difference between funding it at 98000 versus funding it at 85000 is uh, 200, making the balance up to 294000 versus 281000 um, And the thing is, you know, as, the, as, as uh, Dr. Morris spoke to, the, to those placements, that's the right neighborhood uh, for the larger, more expensive placements. It's a uh, ill-defined thing. It depends on the kid and the actual placement, but that's in the right ballpark as far as getting to that place. And and so um, uh, that just paints the picture of where the balance is. It's not like we're at 25,000, we're trying to really ramp it up. We're kind of on the place of getting to your full funding for that. I'd just like a clarification of why you didn't recommend the larger amount originally. Larger amount for the math? Um, it's a really good question. I was trying to be, if you think about where we were two months from now, um, two months ago, we were in a pretty fiscally constrained situation with towns that weren't coming to any clear agreement about the budget. So I think I constrained it. 
Um, I think Mr. Demling's idea is a good one, and I, you know, I support it. But uh, it was coming from the place of trying to get four towns to agree on a budget. That, and you were at those four town meetings. It didn't look entirely clear like we had a pathway, mm -hmm. and trying to create a pathway, I think, okay. um, do that, and then not let us off the hook for the special ed stabilization. We, I imagine, this is the last year we'll fund this. This will be a budget adjustment next year because we wanted to get in the neighborhood of two hundred seventy-five, three hundred thousand dollars because that's. It doesn't. There are some students who's out of district placements, maybe a little more than that, but that's a pretty safe placeholder, um, so that if we do have a student who moves into the district, uh, whose education costs that much, we can manage that year and deal with it the year after without freezing budgets, because that's really what we don't. We want to avoid at all costs. So, hopefully, that answers the question. Any other, Mr. Demling? Uh, this is a separate topic. I didn't want to forget about. Um, so this came up during public comment about uh, the possibility of, uh, of one of our member towns um, essentially gifting us uh, resources for a, a solar study of a, of a different variety than what's in this budget. So this would be looking at um, parking lot canopies. Um, it's, it's a funny topic for me to think about during an open meeting because I'm a member of that other committee and also a member of the JCPC committee where that presentation was submitted and we haven't discussed or voted on that as is Ms. Spitzer. <laughs> Um, so, so just thinking about that with my regional hat on, given that the question was, was asked, um, yeah, I, I guess I would, I would have a hard time saying no to funds that were offered to us, essentially gifted from the town, to investigate something that we would probably want to investigate anyway. Um, you know, in an ideal world, uh, you know, that, that would hopefully happen within the broader context of that, you know, best bang for our buck kind of you know where are we utilizing those funds to to, to get the most sustainable but um, but just from a pure regional school committee point of view um, you know I don't know any of the legalities about accepting gifts and such but there's a superintendent to my right who has his hand up so I will <laughs> stop speaking so this came up for a different reason in the past and so I did uh, I was asked by a different school committee member to inquire about the legality and um, basically the legality operates the same as any gift that would come to the school committee. So if a, a municipality or an individual wants to gift something to the school committee, as you know, they can make a gift for a specific purpose. They can make an, un, you know, uh, I'm forgetting the word, but uh, unrestricted. unrestricted, thank you, gift, and it would be up to the school committee whether to accept it. But there's nothing legally that would preclude uh, or force a school committee to accept a gift from a municipality. It could even be a municipality that doesn't, isn't in the region, right? It, 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 it operates the same way as any other um, person, individual, corporation, or non-for-profit, um, that it would be up to the regional school committee whether it wanted to accept the gift, but it certainly could. So can I just ask a, yeah. a help me understand? So that is not included within the, the, the budget that we're voting on tonight. That That's would, a completely separate it would It would be a gift topic. like the last agenda item at every single meeting yeah. that we have, that yeah. um, you uh, have gifts that are approved or um, donations that are um, come and it goes to the treasurer and um, it's up to the school committee whether they would like mm -hmm. to accept it or not. I guess my question is but that we're not, we don't need to, we probably can't be discussing a potential gift in, in this meeting right now. It is not on the agenda and it's not on the gifts category yep. at the end. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Can Ms. I Spencer? Um, one question just from related, but um, could you provide clarity, because it came up in, again in that meeting, um, about my understanding is the parking and access roads repaving at the high school was limited. It's not a fully redoing the parking lot. It's mm -hmm. just patching up the holes and um, making it more usable. But So the, the section of the parking lot, it's the one we can orient to, yes, that direction, out in front of the building, and particularly essentially the driving lane that's closest to the sort of embankment uh, that's the most sort of torn up. They're actually going to take it down to, uh, I believe, basically uh, to the underneath, uh, you know, gravel and, and re-pitch um, it so that it drains properly because part of the issue has to do with drainage. So they're going to re-pitch that and then re repave it. So it's just that section. So it's really okay. kind of the link, you know, the sort of width of the lot, that sort of driving lane is really all that's going to get done for that. And there are continuing and existing needs for both the middle school and the high school parking lot that would be much more significant in cost. That is Could correct. Could we get a ballpark of 
or do you have a ballpark about that? So um, one that's been discussed that I have a number for, not that that's very helpful, but uh, the middle school parking lot, I think the, si the side on the district offices side, um, I think 60,000 was the number for that. And that was not take it down to the gravel and redo it. That was take a layer off and, and repay, which is a pretty significant and, and helpful uh, level of, of repair. Um, <coughs> But that was about 60,000. And if you think about it, the area is a little bit more than twice the size of this one, but it's not as in depth of, of, of a uh, um, reclaiming and, and resurfacing uh, process as we'll have up here. So that gives you an, kind of an order of magnitude, I mm -hmm. think. Um, but I don't have any better numbers than that. Thank you. Good. Any other? Um, I'm going to ask for advice on how we handle Mr. Demling's earlier um, ask about um, switching the um, contribution to the special special ed stabilization fund. No. Sure. So um, there's actually four votes we're asking for from this agenda item. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the votes page, the first one is about assessment method. So that would be unaffected by Mr. Demling's motion. Mm -hmm. The second one would be affected, the further voted part would be affected um, and so I think what uh, I would recommend from a process perspective um, uh, is that um, when it says voted to adopt a budget of you would uh, it would be adopt a budget um, I think the language I would recommend would be um, consistent with the district presentation and the amendment made by Mr. Demling, or the suggestion made by Mr. Demling, and then the further voted at the bottom would go to 85,000 instead of 98. But I think it then, for the record, would note that it's consistent with what was presented with that um, with that um, change. Uh, the other two votes, the debt assessment and capital plan bond authorization, would be unaffected as well by the discussion that um, uh, Mr. Demling, Demling engendered. And one other question, it's two-thirds majority of those present. It is. Okay. Is it answer? No? Oh, I thought you had a question. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Does somebody want to uh, read our motion? Mr. Demling? Uh, I move to amend Section 6 of the amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement by adding subsection J as follows. For fiscal year 2021 only, the alternative operating budget assessment shall be calculated as 45% of a five-year average of minimum contributions with the remainder of the assessment allocated to the member towns in accordance with the per-pupil method found in Section 6E of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement. The five-year average of minimum contributions will include the five most recent years or take any other action relative thereto. It's moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded by Spitzer. Um, all those in favor signify yes by raising your hand. Uh, six to zero. <coughs> Another motion? I suppose I can move. Um, I move to adopt a budget consistent with the district's presentation with the change suggested by Mr. Demling for fiscal year 2021 for the Amherst Pelham Regional School District and to assess member towns according to the method in the just approved amendment as follows. Amherst, $16,798,875. Pelham, $913,077. Leverett, one million five hundred and seven thousand nine hundred and fifty five dollars and Shootsbury one million seven hundred nineteen thousand one hundred and ninety seven. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signal yes. No, I by, oh. Just just a quick uh motion question. That's right. Oh should the further vote. Uh, yeah, it, does that does that need to be part of this motion? This, this and further moved, or can that be a separate motion? I think a separate motion probably makes sense. Okay, and is it okay that we didn't mention the, the sum total at the beginning, a budget of 32, 639, 531? I would recommend that there's uh, an amendment to the motion to include that. 
That might not be the right language. I'm not a reference rules person, so I apologize. Mr. Deming. Uh, I move to amend the motion to state adopt a budget of $32,639,531. Second the motion. And seconded. So we're voting on the motion to amend mm -hmm. right. the previous motion. All those in favor signal yes by raising your hand. Six to zero. And now we'll vote on the prior now amended motion. All those in favor signal by raising, raising your hand. Six, yes. Do we have another motion? Mr. Demo, or Ms. Okay, Spencer. Like Ms. Spencer. <laughs> okay. I move that the district, excuse me, skipped ahead. Um, I move to assess member towns for debt service on previously approved projects according. We have a further voted oh. before that. Sorry, move to employee. <laughs> yes. Let me start again. I move that the, included within this budget proposal is a contribution of 85000 to the Special Education Stabilization Fund. Second. Moved in second. All those in favor, signal yes by raising your hand. Six zero. Just, Mr. Downing. Just, just a procedural thing, because sometimes I forget what I'm, so I'm going to say. Before we vote, after we do like a second, if you could just call for, um, is there any further discussion? Further discussion Nine times yes. out of ten, there isn't because we've had the discussion before the motion, but occasionally something will pop into my head after that. Thank you. <laughs> um, do we have another motion? Ms. Stancer. Um, I move that we assess member towns for debt service on previously approved projects according to the debt schedule for 50, fiscal year 21 as follows. Amherst. $342,141, Pelham, $27,540, Leverett, $40,456, and Shootsbury, $33,357. A second. Are there any further nah. discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor, signal yes by raising your hand. Six to zero. Yeah, who gets, who gets excited to read the last one? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Oh, Devlin. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> I move that the district. <laughs> I, start that over. I move that the district hereby appropriates the sum of four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for the purpose of paying costs of the following projects, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto. One, high school exhaust fans in the amount of forty-five thousand dollars. Two, HVAC modifications for Summit Academy and PIP in the amount of $50,000. Three, renovations in the high school girls' locker room in the amount of $15,000. Four, renovations of the walk-in cooler and freezer at the high school in the amount of $45,000. Five, replacement of AC chillers at the middle school in the amount of $100,000. Six, makerspace renovations at the middle school in the amount of $50,000. Seven, district-wide solar PV study in the amount of $15,000. Eight, district-wide ADA improvements in the amount of $50,000. Nine, district-wide asbestos abatement and management in the amount of $20,000. Ten, district-wide access control upgrades in the amount of $15,000. And eleven, grounds improvements at the high school in the amount of $15,000, said sum to be expended at the direction of the Regional School District School Committee. To meet this appropriation, the district treasurer is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Chapter 71, Section 16D of the General Laws and the District Agreement as amended, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any such premium applied to the payments of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes, may be applied to the payment or of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount, and I further move that within 48 hours from the date of which this vote is adopted, the Secretary be and hereby is instructed to notify the Board of Selectmen of each of the member towns of the district in writing as to the amount and general purposes of the debt herein authorized as required by Chapter 71, Section 16B of the General Laws and by the District Agreement. In addition, the Committee shall cause 
the same information to be published within 10 days after such authorization as a paid notice in a newspaper circulating in the district. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? I, I have Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. Um, I just want to say thank you that we got the 15000 for the looking at the renovations of the girls' locker room, but it actually won't happen until 2025. Thank you. Any further discussion? No? Seeing none, all those in favor signal yes by raising your hand. Six to zero. Thank you. Thank you all. Moving on to our next item, the bus contract approval. And this is a vote as well. I was hoping he would introduce it a little bit. But I, I will instead. Uh, it's, it's pretty uh, straightforward at this point. Um, so we put out a bid for uh, bus services. We do this every, uh, actually, five years. We do a three-year contract with two one-year extensions. Um, we had the bid opening in early January. Uh, there were two qualified bidders. Uh, traditionally, we've had two companies win the two different parts of the bid. Uh, this year, a single company won both parts of the bid, um, which is why there's a single contract in front of you uh, with the five-star transportation company out of Southwick, I believe. Um, and so. Uh, we bring it to you for a vote of approval, and then we'll ultimately need see signatures from all of you. Um, simultaneously, we're, we've sent this to the, to the bus company for um, their signature as well. Um, we are under a little bit of a time constraint, so once, oh, once the bid's open and, and uh, the determination of the winner has been uh, declared, then there's, a, there's like a 60-day time window. I think we have until early April to actually get it all signed, sealed in that regard. Um, I don't know, I want to say like the 8th or 9th of April, which would be 60 days. So taking care of this now, we'll uh, make sure we're well within our deadline. Um, and I'd answer any questions about the contract itself if people have them. Or, yeah. Mr. Demling. Um Not being a contract expert, is there anything in here that you saw that was substantially different or out of the ordinary from our previous bus contract? No. <laughs> we made very, 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 very few changes other than just, you know, we refined things like the mileage that uh, we know to be the case or the needs for the, for the district, um, and the bidders were aware of that from the start. Um, so the format of it has not really changed from previous, previous contracts. Um, I will say just for informational purposes, um, uh, and this wasn't surprising because because my predecessor, Mr. Mangato, had, had uh, anticipated a fairly significant increase in price. Um, you know, we, over the subsequent years, we'll go up by a, a cost of living index, basically, a, a consumer price index change year to year, which uh, in our last contract, there was actually a year went down. Um, partly due to that, partly due to changes in, in other aspects of, of um, costs that businesses take on. Um, and anticipating a, a fairly modest increase over the you know, ensuing years, the, the bids came in significantly higher. Um, so overall on the contract, about 10% higher than what we're paying this year. So it was a pretty significant jump. Uh, a little harder on the section of routes that cover Leverett and Toothbury. That jumped a much, much more than that. Um, I had a, a good conversation with the administrators in both uh, Leverett and Toothbury about why it went up as much as it did, but it went up quite a bit. They had a the price index, I mean, the price cost went up, but also the, the way in which we attribute those costs also worked against them. So their increase was really significant, and, and really it's, it's going to be difficult for them. I understand that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, the impact on, on this budget uh, was in, in about the 10% the range or so as far as increase. So it was a pretty, pretty significant increase. Fortunately, our, our predictions in our budgeting was, was close to that, so you didn't see wild changes in budget relative to this, but nonetheless, it was a, a significant change from our current year contract as far as cost. Mr. Sullivan? Well, you, you answered my first question already. And the second one is, where will the buses be housed? Are they coming all the way from Southwick, or are they 
going to be a lot closer than that. There generally there's some some constraints within the within the contract about how close they have to be. Um, they actually have a facility off of Rocky Hill Road, if I'm not mistaken, right over by the there's a storage place yeah. there across yeah. from the UMass okay. uh, Stadium. So I think most of them will be there. Um, but there is a certain response time if something breaks down that they have to uh, to uh, be able to meet. So they'll they'll have some. Even if they bring some from a further distance, they'll have to have some there for the purposes of meeting that requirement. Ms. Spitzer? Uh, um, two questions related to our earlier conversation. Um, are fuel costs included in, um, in, in this, or do we bear the fluctuations in the cost of fueling the um, buses? Fuel costs I are built in. Okay, because they've just dropped. dropped. Oh. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> right. Um, I'm just something. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I would not, not have been asking this two weeks ago, but in the event that we are not transporting students because we are not holding classes, is there anything built into the contract that would allow us to not have to pay for the, the services that we're not using? So I think we will have to have some conversations with them about it because I think it changes things a little bit. Uh, generally, they bill us for essentially services rendered. Mm -hmm. And so if they're not driving, is you know they are contracted for a certain number of days of, of driving. And if they drive fewer days, because, you know, if like uh, the superintendent was talking about, you know, if the state says, well, you just have to meet that 185 that you set out. So June 22nd, I think is the last day if we use all our, all our snow days. And, mm -hmm. um, and yet we close for two weeks, there's 10 fewer days of driving. Exactly. I think that begs a series of questions we need to figure out because, I, and I think, you know, we'll ask that, uh, you know, that's not a contingency written into the contract, so we'll have to mm -hmm. look at our contract language in particular around that, and then we'll also have to look uh, at what the state's guidance is relative to that and what their expectations are, and we'll go from there. Thanks. Mr. Demling. I, I hate to throw a wrench into the works, but <laughs> Ms. Spitzer just made a couple of really good points. So. Would it would it be more prudent to have those conversations before we sign the contract? I mean, I know you just said we're under a time crunch, um, but I, I'm just I'm just wondering if given given what's happening, I mean, we have to look at kind of like you know outside the box scenarios, <laughs> right? And so, um, are we going to box ourselves into a position that's less fiscally um, advantageous if we sign this contract now and then ask for leniency? Well, I think it's a valuable question to ask because this contract takes effect, you know, essentially July 1, and so, you know, COVID-19 may be with us in the fall and, and next winter. So I think it's a, it's a salient, you know, question to ask. Um, and to be perfectly blunt, I, I just don't know the detail of the contract yeah. at, at that level to know. We might have a very clear answer on that. Um, uh, so it's, you know, we do have the latitude of a meeting in a week or two weeks. Two weeks, okay. um, which would still sort of fit within the time frame of the requirement we have relative to when the bids were open. It's at the committee's you know, discretion as to whether they choose to vote on this tonight or not. Uh, if you want that question answered, we can certainly get that answer. And, or you can vote it, and then I could just inform you about what the situation is. Um, you, you know, the, 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 whether that's covered by the, the language of the bid may influence whether we can alter the contract or not as well. Right. So we may be stuck kind of either way. I'm not sure. It can't hurt to delay. Mr. Um, yeah, I, I guess so I agree with Mr. Rooney. <laughs> um, yeah, if it's a matter of just getting an update and then, uh, you know, potentially approving the contract or not, I guess I, I would be more comfortable with that getting as much information as we can about, about what, what our options are there. Sure. If, you know, um, and, you know, the, the fuel cost question is another one that I don't know if, how much we'll be able to definitively answer, but if, if we are in a case where that, that global price has just dropped way down uh, and, and we're locking in something for a six-year contract, um, it, 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 may, it, it may be prudent to reevaluate that. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to try and time the market, blah, 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 but, um, you know, just a, a pause if it's not going to impact our, you know, ability to closing the contract sounds pretty so there's a couple things I would offer relative to that there's also a few years ago if you recall that gas went from mm -hmm. you know buck 75 to like four dollars a gallon uh, we didn't have to pay you know that where it sort of lags a little bit but is factored in is in that cost uh, consumer price index so if 
energy prices, particularly oil prices, drop and stay low, uh, the overall uh, you know, effect on economy is, is such that it may cause that to reduce our price. So it lags and is not an immediate one-to-one -one sort of linear uh, relationship, but nonetheless, there's some aspect of it captured there. Um, as, as a component piece of that, but certainly have to provide more clarity later. Mr. Sullivan. Just want to mention that um, diesel prices don't usually fluctuate and drop as hard as gasoline prices mm -hmm. do. Can I ask one clarifying question, Mr. Sullivan? What date by? I think we have that? till April. Either eighth or ninth. Okay. To, I just want to, to make sure the committee perfectly had perfectly signed. But date I think that we need to we still have go one way or the other. A little bit of wiggle room. Okay. There. Very good. So, am I hearing that we want to get those questions answered before we vote? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to reiterate the questions, make sure I get it right. <laughs> yes. So if we have fewer than you know, fewer days of school than the contracted days, is one question. Sort of what's. Uh, is, is, is sort of what happens relative to that. What's our obligation to pay for days that we don't use? Um, the second would be just to provide greater clarity around the price of fuel and its impact. Was there another one? Mr. Debbie? Yeah, I guess, again, not to throw a wrench in the works, but I guess what I'm thinking out loud is if, and I don't know what the price is for the fuel that these buses use, just to be clear. <laughs> That's right. why I'm asking the question. Uh, but if, if there was a recent sharp drop in that, um, you know, would it, would it be more advantageous to renegotiate the contract at a, at a lower price point? Is that even possible? What are the, what are the variables there that, that we have to, you know, account for? Is that? Dr. Morris? Yeah, so I think the challenge with that is that it was an open bid process. Mm -hmm. So our ability to renegotiate something that was from a bid process without breaking procurement law is, my guess, is somewhat limited. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Slaughter. I, I but think it's correct. I think the other part about missing days, um, since it's sort of the, the bid process was silent on it, it might be opportunity to have that conversation be clarified. But right. I think the other piece would be rebidding the whole thing just in fairness to all the companies, because it's not just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the price point got lower for one company, it's getting lower across the board. Right. So we're asking for clarity. Okay. Great. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, okay, moving on to um, warrant review. Is that Ms. Spitzer? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Warrant review is um, before school choice. Can I just clarify? Um, you handed me uh, all of the warrants that I, because I have some that I did, had copies of previously, and then you gave me a I packet. I think I handed you all of them. So okay, so that would might, be wonderful. So I'll just go through this. I think you packet. can go through the whole stack. You, it will also include some that were signed by Mr. Fonch. Okay, so I'll report on those. Is, is it important that I? Distinguish, distinguish that? between ones that I signed and no, I think the okay. reporting is about the amount of money spent from okay. what sources is really a critical piece. And we're doing it kind of page by page rather than summarizing. So, bear with me. Um, on March second of two, 2020, um, I authorized a transfer request for seventeen thousand dollars and eight hundred and forty-one dollars and ninety-two cents um, to replenish. So. From, sorry. It was a funds transfer from the student activity master account to replenish funds expended from the principal student activity account. And again, that was on March 2nd, 2020. On February 20th of 2020, I authorized a request to move $244 um, to be transferred from the district treasurer's student activity master account to replenish funds expended from the principal student activity account. Um, I also authorized by signature 
to payables in the amount of one hundred and four thousand dollars five hundred eighty sorry three hundred eighty seven dollars and fifty cents for the warrant dated March third of twenty twenty. Um, this included general fund expenses of $61,617.09, revolving fund expenses of $12,902.27, and grant fund expenses of $29,754.04, and other funds in the amount of $1,114.10 excuse me, $114 for each SH gifts, which SH was senior high. Senior high, okay. Right. That was dated March 2nd, 2020. This is was authorized by Kip Fonch um, to, to payables in the amount of $6,268.04 for the warrant dated February 3rd, 2020. This included General fund expenses of six thousand dollars two hundred sixty-eight six thousand two hundred sixty-eight dollars and four cents. Also on February fourteenth, twenty twenty, Kip Fonch authorized a signature to payables in the amount of two hundred twelve thousand five hundred forty-three dollars and sixty-nine cents for the warrant dated February fourteenth, twenty twenty. This included general fund expenses of $207,952.35, revolving fund expenses of $4,212.50, and other funds in the amount of $378.84 for senior high gifts. All right. I authorized by my signature to pay bills in the amount of $612,930. $3.81 for the warrant dated February 20th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $606,078.81, revolving fund expenses of $500, and grant fund expenses of $6,325. This is the final one. Um, I also authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of 800 excuse me, $88,261.60 for the warrant dated February 25th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $67,939.32, revolving fund expenses of $14,688.28, and grant fund expenses of $5,255 and other fund expenses of $379 for high school gifts. And that is Dr. Slaughter. Just to add one thing. So the first couple that she read were transfers related to student activities, just as a reminder in case you've forgotten. Our student activities funds sit in sort of two accounts. We have a savings account, is where things go. So when funds are collected by virtue of fundraising or gifts, to those, to those student activities, they sit in that. We try to, the, the sort of checking account uh, that we sort of spend money out of, we try to keep a limit on how much is held in there so as to manage the, the, the cash flow and to uh, you know make sure that our principals are, are uh, taking care of that in a conscientious way. Uh, but it requires to move money from one to the other, requires your permission, that's why it's there. The reason I bring this up is, as a reminder is that if around some of the uh, changes to what we're doing relative to COVID-19. Uh, we may have to refund people who have paid into a student activities fund. So mm. there may wow. be more of these kind of transfers that come up because we'll be reimbursing people and that will create a, a bit more of a volume of, of outflow. So we'll need to move stuff from savings, which is where it sits now. So I just want to give you a heads up that, that that may occur as we move ahead. We'll see how it plays out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, next on our agenda is our school choice vote. So that is also on the same page of warrant items, uh, or not warrant items, excuse me, um, uh, vote items that was mentioned earlier. As I ex uh, expressed last week at the hearing, um, uh, my recommendation is to not accept new school choice students. Mm -hmm. And to be very clear, that would still net an increase of school choice students because of the number of school choice students coming from our four communities and that are currently sixth grade students. 
um, that we're already seeing an increase of about 14 from the current year, just based on graduating 12th graders and then incoming 7th graders. From next year, uh, current school choice students would remain in our district, and 6th grade students who are in our, any of our member communities be welcomed into 7th grade. But it's uh, we don't see ourselves having slots without increasing class size beyond the natural flow, so I'd rather not uh, have false hopes for community members and family members who, from other communities who apply for school choice uh, if we actually don't indeed plan to take any. So that is my recommendation for you to consider. Mr. Medina? My understanding, this is a one-year vote. It does not imply a change in policy of any kind. That is correct. Every year, actually, it's a, it, the default setting, if you don't vote, is, a, is your district is school choice, um, according to state regs, and you have to vote every year. Otherwise, the default sort of takes over. Um, and I would not imagine, to your point, that this is a change in practice. I think it's looking at um, just a one-year anomaly of um, sixth graders and how many students across our four towns um, are school choice in their community and then flowing to the seventh grade and, and a pretty low twelfth grade. Any other discussion? No? Do you have a motion? Mr. Devlin? Uh, I move to not accept new school choice students in the 2020-2021 school year other than those coming from the four sending elementary school districts. Second. Oh. Go. <laughs> Second. Seconded by Mr. Menino. Um, and moved by Mr. Devlin. Any further discussion? Mr. Denley. I just want to say I appreciate the school choice program and, and the families that contribute to our community. That some of them are most active in our PGOs. And, um, you know, like uh, Dr. Morris said, this is a numbers thing for this year. Uh, but it certainly doesn't change my philosophy or approach to the program, which is it allows us to add hundreds of thousands of dollars of services every year to our budget. And uh, in addition to welcoming lots of new and diverse yep. students to our community, which Absolutely. is a win win. So. Um, all those in favor of the motion, um, please signal yes by raising your hand. Six to zero. Try to make up time in the next one. And as yeah. well. <laughs> moving, moving on to Student Opportunity Act plan. This is a very brief one. So, uh, as part of the Student Opportunity Act that was passed by the legislature in the fall, every district, regardless of whether they're getting any anticipated new funds or not, is required to complete a Student Opportunity Act plan. What you see is the template um, spoofed stuff by our clerical staff. Of course, it's like a horrific form that gets documented, <laughs> sent to Desi, but this looks a little nicer. And we wanted it to look nicer because we put it in the newsletter last week. It was also just uh, sent to CPAC for discussion at their meeting across all three districts. The region is not anticipating having significantly more funding as a result of the Student Opportunity Act. That's not a critique of the act. If you were in Holyoke or Springfield or Brockton, or Boston, you'd see significant amounts of new aid coming in. So the way this state uh, set it out is uh, any district over uh, that was receiving over $1.5 million in new aid had a long form. We are not close to that group. So uh, we have a short form, which is intended to be two pages. They had an exemplar, which I followed. Um, so uh, we sent it out to the larger community. We sent it to CPAC for their feedback. Um, LPAC's not meeting in a timeline. It does need to be voted by every district in uh, the month of March. Uh, I don't think we need to belabor the topic tonight. If any committee members have feedback before the next meeting, they can um, communicate that to me. I'll also be looking at the feedback I received from the larger community, which I think, frankly, has its mind on other things at the moment. Um, but we did communicate it out. Uh, all three districts last week, and I actually think I want to give the state credit. I know I said some negative things about perhaps them in the past. I think this was a very doable, achievable form that asked the right questions and focused superintendents to focus on, uh, or, or got the students, forces, pushes superintendents to focus on what are critical subgroups in the community that need additional support for the school to be successful and what's an active plan to do that. Um, so I really compliment the state for coming up with a reasonable plan. Uh, I'm, I'm unaware, but I heard from a legislator that perhaps charter schools have a different timeline and expectations around this. I don't know if that's true, but there may be people on the committee who want to look at this. But from my perspective, other than the timeline being too quick to complete these, um, fortunately we did you know, district-based um, strategic planning last year, and that could be integrated into a lot of this work. So um, it's really just an update for the committee and the community. It's been shared out with the larger 
uh, all the, all the um, staff and families um, in the community. And if there's any feedback individual committee members want to give me, you can certainly give it to me now, but feel free to contact me anytime between the next meeting. Um, but I just wanted to at least share publicly that it does need to be voted uh, before the end of the month. And that's it. Mr. Menina. I have to ask, we, is it wor useful to assess what the private, the charge school's motivations may be for uh, supporting this or not? You mean why their timeline might be yeah. different? Uh, that was, again, I heard that from a legislator Friday. I was unaware of that, that opinion. I, I have not verified, been um, knee deep in other things, so I have not verified the validity of that, but I okay. just know given the topic of charter schools has come up in a variety of ways on this committee that um, people might be interested at least to find out if that assertion is true. Assertion, excuse me, is true. But uh, I apologize, I did not get to, I planned to get to that before tonight's meeting and it didn't happen. Ms. Stanzer. Um, on the top of the back of the page where you have the two items for commitment three, what is extended engagement rate? So that is um, another way to measure um, students who stay with our school. So for instance, there are students who don't graduate our school at age 18, and yet they stay engaged with school activities. Um, so for instance, they may be students who are still trying to pass the MCAS. They may be students with special needs who continue on extended services beyond okay. 18. So it's another DESI metric that okay. um, accounts for students who may not have passed the MCAS, but haven't dropped out. Okay. So it's a different way to calculate that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? No? Okay. Okay. Um, moving on to um, public comment management. So this is a conversation. We do have a policy that's very general about public comment, um, and I think um, the purpose uh, um, of, this, of tonight's discussion is to talk about how we're implementing that policy um, and how we're executing that in our meetings. So. I have Ms. Stancer. I have a question. Uh, not, I mean, just being on the committee this year, where does the three minute time for comment come from? Do we set that, or is, is that a st kind of a standard for public comment and meetings? I, I'm not suggesting we extend it. I'm just wondering how that got set. Mr. Daly? So it's it's uh, it's in our policy. Yeah. It's uh, policy BEDH okay. on the website. Uh, and it okay. says uh, speakers generally will be allowed a maximum of three minutes to speak, um, and that the ch it's chair's discretion uh, can change that length. Okay. Uh, but but uh, okay. speakers generally that's it's yeah. It's so it's, it's it's been written in our policy. Mm -hmm. Who knows who decided? I think that's it's, what it should be. I think it's pretty standard with open meeting law. Okay. Uh, or, or the it's uh, I shouldn't say standard. It's it's the general practice of open okay. meetings that, was that at public what I was comment thinking. unless they say otherwise the kind mm -hmm. of default uh, practice is is three minutes. Okay. Yes, Ms. I have just one comment. Um, I think that when you you say you announce that it's time for the public comment because we have people perhaps watching from home who have not seen this before, to explain that we do not reply to public comments. I think that mm. would be a good piece to add. I also think sometimes people sitting out there are expecting something and it doesn't happen. So I think that would be good to add. Mm -hmm. Mr. Denley? So I think, um, you know, generally speaking, you know, given that the policy is very broad and, and defers to the chair's discretion, I just think uh, consistent application of, of how we um, uh, apply the rules and the expectations would, mm -hmm. would be helpful. Um, uh, and, and it, like I think the chair did that tonight with uh, you know setting out the expectation about sharing of time and three minutes and uh, because you know it's the reality of the situation is that we have vast majority of people that will work within the rules and 
you know, sometimes, and I mean, I've been up there before myself, before I was on school committee. It could be nervous and overwhelming, mm -hmm. and you go past three minutes, you don't, it's, it's an honest mistake, mm -hmm. right? Or, or uh, you need some help or, or notes from somebody. Um, but it's, it's, it's a different thing if, if you are intentionally breaking the rules and, and not respecting that the standards ought to be applied to everyone for the, in the issue of fairness. So I think, um, you know, articulating that the, that the sharing of time is, is, not, is not a thing. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not in our policy. I'm not sure what that um, means. Like, I so, don't understand your initial... Yeah, so I'm, what, what we mean is the example of um, someone goes over three minutes and then they want to keep speaking. And so somebody else will come up and say, I cede my time to the speaker. And then so the speaker continues on. And if somebody else comes oh. up, then they can continue on and on and on. Like, so we've had, in fact, it's... They could pass the baton, yeah. but they cannot. Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's ironic to me because actually in our policy, it says that if a group shows up, um, that we encourage a one speaker to speak for the group. Right? We've had very large groups of... 60 people or, or ish mm -hmm. that, who would go on for hours if it wasn't for one person, you know, respecting the three minute rule. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think between that and, you know, also the going over time, I think that's why it's chair's discretion, right? It's that you can, you can, you know, when someone is insincere, insincerely making an honest mistake and, and when it's, when it's a different case. Um, mm -hmm. I think the other thing we've probably struggled a, a bit with, um, with public comment is just when when the, the tone and the content gets very um, visceral and attacking of individuals, I feel like we don't um, have a very precise and clear understanding of what the legal uh, bounds are on that. I think, you know, so we, we have um, we had the, the legal advice from our council uh, that, that, uh, that you shared um, with, with the committee um, that suggested it's a pretty broad Interpretation of what's allowed given First Amendment. There was a, there was a ruling with Natick um, School Committee in their in their public comment. Um, you know, I, I personally, I, th I think it would help to have um, some clar some further clarification on that from Council. I think uh, you know when we talk about defamatory remarks, it's it might be a different case legally. I don't know, which is why I would want to get the mm -hmm. the guidance. Whether you're talking about uh, the superintendent or school committee member or a family member or a friend of a school committee member or a family or friend of the superintendent or a staff member or a student or a member of, the, you know, there's all these different, mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't adjudicate truth or falsehood in when public comments. People can come up and say that the sky is yellow when they're perfectly allowed to do that. Um, and so when it gets into making assertions about individuals, I think, um, I mean, I know about you all, but I, th I would be more comfortable with some, some clearer guidance about which which groups are allowed to have those comments uh, and, and which groups are not. So. Mr. Menino. Two points. Um, the, I do want to question the three-minute allotment. I've seen people who have well thought out cogent letters trying to read the entire one page of a side and they don't finish in three minutes. I mean, uh, you know, I, they just don't. So maybe it needs to be five minutes. And the second point is that letter. That le did that letter say that defamatory remarks are permissible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it said defamatory remarks are permissible. I just wanted to make sure I get that straight. Dr. Morris. So I think, um, I think if there was a committee member or two who wanted to follow up legally on kind of other questions, and that, that memo is pretty dated. Um, my advice would be having one or two members, preferably two, because I just think that way two people hear the same thing. Mm -hmm. Set up a conference call with our attorney um, to talk through some of the questions. It, like if, if, if there's a feeling like that memo isn't sufficient uh, or came from questions from committee members who are no longer are on the committee or, you know, whatever. So I'm hearing a little bit of that. Um, I think having two committee members set a, co a conference call with, with um, the attorney uh, and then report back to the larger committee so that there's more clarity, that would be my recommendation if the committee feels like it needs more clarity. Ms. Spitzer? So if, and I'm looking at Mr. Sullivan because I think we were both at the same policy subcommittee with um, Ms. Westmoreland. And so it was sort of around this idea of trying to think about whether or not we needed to make changes to the policy. And clearly I think this letter says we do need to make changes, but I think if anything they're going in the opposite direction of what 
I'm hearing from the committee in terms of what they would like to see. Um, so, so I think the tricky thing was when we met, and, and I will be you know very open that I'm I'm generally think that we want, and this is my own personal opinion. I know there are folks here, with, but I think generally we want to err on the side of free speech and on the side of allowing folks to um, come and, and even if we disagree with what they're saying to give them a, a venue for that. Um, I know sometimes it's really uncomfortable, but I think as public officials, I think it's part of what we signed up for. So I guess it, just because I have a feeling there are differences in opinion on what we'd want to do, it's hard to put create a subgroup of folks to get to the illegal opinion. I think clearly there will be a legal opinion on what we can and can't do that may go beyond what's here, but it, I got frustrated because I felt like when we met in that small group, there were folks I wanted to have on the table to talk about this in more depth. And it's a kind of uncomfortable thing to have this conversation in open meeting law, but um, in an open setting like this, because I think we do have a lot of different opinions on it. And I just wanted to put it out there. Um, and then the other thing is just going back to Mr. Demling's point about Glenn Clarity, I feel like it's pretty specific in the letter. It says, um, that we are allowed from naming or otherwise identifying staff and students. Um, that seemed to be, there was support in the legal argument for that. I think it's not, maybe what you're saying is clarity on people related to us who are officials who are not necessarily ex um, exempted from this idea of being able to be named and criticized in public. These are the yeah. points where I think we need to have a conversation as a group because I think it's hard for the two people who are going to be talking or the one person talking to get much clarity. I, I think um, I, I, I sort of personally see it as um, uh, sort of related but separate questions because I think we can ask for legal opinion on sort of how you might approach a particular thing without having sort of a proposal mm -hmm. that you're reviewing. It's, it's really, you know, pro providing sort of updated guidance on, um, on what is feasible um, from a policy perspective. And I also sort of, maybe I'm misunderstanding some a little bit, I'm gonna look at Mr. Demling, but I, I sort of understand the question not to restrict defamatory comments, um, but how do we address them um, and maybe that's not what you were asking, because I, I think, you know, the comment was if, if somebody says the sky is yellow, and we all know it's not, but the way our public comment section, you know, segment of our meeting is structured, we can't respond to that. Mm -hmm. There's not a mechanism to sort of present an alternative perspective or factual basis or evidence to the contrary to that. and. You know, and so in the particular situation where somebody is making false accusations or allegations about an individual, maybe not by naming them, how do we, how do we address that? We, you know, in, in sort of, yes. we don't really want to just leave that out there hanging, yeah. um, but what, what can we do as a, as a committee that's sort of within the realm of both free speech and policy and open meeting? Is that Mr. Demley? <laughs> um. So that's interesting, but that that isn't what I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I was just, I was, I think the the most achievable outcome would be to totally sidestep the question of what ought to be allowed, like any opinions about free speech or not free speech, and just say, well, what what legal groups ought there not to be defamatory speech about, right? So like students and and um, staff are called out in the memo from our attorney um, from a year and a half ago. That, that sort of begs the question, are there other specific groups of people who would also be protected? And, and, and when we talk about protection, we're really talking about, will the chair gavel them down, you know, and cut off the public comment? Um, I, think, I think having that clear guidance, as opposed to trying to figure out in the moment mm. of, well, it said staff and students and it didn't specify anybody else, so, you know, you can come in and talk about anybody off the street, any member of the public. Like I was imagine if I was a member of the public, not associated with the schools, for example, uh, and someone in public comment was saying outrageous things, um, I, I would imagine there would be reasonable concern there. And so I think we just want to be clear about what our sort of obligations are. 
um, less less than a broad-based mm -hmm. kind of back and forth discussion about what ought to happen from mm -hmm. a free speech point of view. Mm -hmm. Mr. Menino? I have to go back to your original concern about what if a uh, public uh, person from the audience says something that is clearly defamatory and hurts that person's reputations, maybe hurts their livelihood, and we sit here moot, and the public never hears a rebuttal. How do we address that? What do we do about that? Nothing? And let it pass? Ms. Stanter? It seems to me that's the question you were just, the issue you were just talking about, and I guess I feel like guidance on that would be helpful. What legal guidance is there for that kind of thing? Because it's very difficult, especially for the person who's sitting up here running the meeting. <laughs> so, um, Ms. Spitzer? And maybe it's nothing. Oh, sorry. I mean, maybe, maybe the answer is nothing. You just have to good and bear let it. it go. But it would be good to know that. Mm -hmm. I almost wonder if that's a separate question from. Um, the issue of public comment, because I could see that same type of situation arising from public um, docu you know, blogs or um, newspaper articles. Like, I feel like there are a lot of different ways in which that type of situation could arise, and it wouldn't be limited to things that people come up to the microphone and say, but could happen otherwise. And we could mm -hmm. potentially have a policy on how to address those types of issues that aren't limited to public comment. I think I see them as two, those two things as separate things as well because the public comment is here with us and people talking directly to us. I think somebody doing something outside of the meeting that might be the same kind of thing, but it's not here in an official school committee meeting is really a little bit different. Would be good to know that too, but I don't see that as being tied into the public comment here. Mm -hmm. I, I do think, sort of going back to your, your first statement, which is in opening co public comment, trying to, making sure that we make that statement, mm -hmm. or I, in this case, <laughs> make mm -hmm. that statement that says, we're not going, this is public comment, it's not a conversation where we, we cannot respond, mm -hmm. that can, so, to a certain extent, help, not completely, by saying that by us not responding to your, you know, a particular statement, that is not by any means an endorsement or support of that perspective, it's, that's how that's we are supposed to run this mm -hmm. meeting. Um, and I, I think that can go potentially a long way because I agree that by us sitting here and not responding to potentially false allegations, like we're letting it stand and s without knowing that we're not allowed to speak, it could mm -hmm. be perceived as we're endorsing or supporting or not yeah. at least challenging that mm -hmm. statement. Um, so I, I think in that light, making that statement up front is important. Okay. Yeah. Express that caveat in a couple of ways, not just stated state in another word, stated in another way, and then, then let pu public comment mm -hmm. begin. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Spitzer? One other related point is that um, we're now having these, um, not now, but we, we have hearings, um, and I think they have a slightly, they, they also engage the public, and um, I'm just realizing, you know, when I click on policy BEE, -E, it's page not found, and um, it's actually not listed under the, at least I can't find that policy, but I'm, I'm wondering if that policy is at all changed with the charter, and if we may need to, I think at the very least we should, oh, there it is, okay. But I just m want to highlight the fact that these budget hearings are another place where this is potentially these issues could come up, and we may want to think about looking at those two if we're looking at this issue in the context of public comment. Mr. Benina? What next? What, is this the end of this discussion? Is there a future? Um, well, we're not at the next agenda item, which is the future <laughs> agenda planning. But, that would suggest but that I this think is the end of this discussion. <laughs> it does feel like we want to come back to this, and I think sort of are there um, 
so I know the policy subcommittee is not scheduled to I don't believe scheduled to meet, um, and, but are there, um, and this kind of leads into our next conversation, but are there two people to, you know, following on Dr. Morris's suggestion um, that would want to follow up on this with, um, with uh, council um, to get some of that guidance on that update on that memo? So uh, I think it makes sense for the, for the, our acting chair to be part of the, part of that. And I would, uh, Ms. Spitzer, I think uh, her perspective on this, I would, I would value if, uh, she was available for that. Sure. Being voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, voluntold. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Noted. So, um, subcommittee organization. Um, so this does sort of relate to the prior conversation and. Um, one of the things um, I, I put this on the agenda because I wanted to have this conversation about um, it, it gets to the number of meetings, the number of hours that committee members are asked to to serve, um, and um, and all the various sort of ways that we are working and um, providing service to to our district. Um, and that none of us are sitting around eating bonbons. Um, we all lead very busy lives and have day jobs or day lives that um, uh, that compete for our attention with with the work that we're doing in the district. Um, and then also the challenge of um, finding people that are willing to step up and and do this that do this work. And so really trying to think through what is the core focus of our work as a committee. And in what way do, do these subcommittees um, support or um, challenge that role um, and our ability to do the job and our ability and the community's ability, frankly, to, to envision themselves being able to serve or step up to serve should any one of us um, need to step down. Um, we have, I, I don't think we have it in here in the packet, but if you look at the spreadsheet of subcommittees, we have... I think at least two pages of tiny, oh. tiny print of subcommittees, um, not all of which meet regularly, but it, it is intimidating to look at that list. So, at least, um, sorry, my perspective. Um, and so I wanted to have that conversation here in terms of thinking about how many sort of standing subcommittees, um, you know, in what role do subcommittees play in, or standing subcommittees play in doing our work? Um, do we need them all? Do we need to have sort of regular monthly meetings for, um, you know, a variety of a whole host of um, subcommittees? Or are there other ways for us to tackle some of the work that needs to be done in between these meetings um, in a way that isn't as um, stressful on our own schedules and our own time and sort of getting a group of people, a group of busy people together to meet on a regular basis? So I, I talked a lot. I sort of float that out there, and I um, would love to just hear other people's ideas um, and thoughts on that, suggestions on, on that. I, I think we have a few committees that haven't, subcommittees, sorry, that I haven't met in a while, so thinking through that, and, and this really is just a discussion. Mr. Demley. Uh, well, so, um, so I'm glad you brought this up, because so one effort that um, the last couple of years that I thought was maybe a good model for some of this with, was the, um, the state-level advocacy work that I did with um, Ms. Ordonez. So she was the one who originally brought me up to speed on, on what the issues were at the state level. And then um, a lot of the advocacy work was uh, about uh, brainstorming, about meeting with a representative or meeting with a school committee colleague, and then uh, what did we want to focus on ter in terms of bringing back and suggesting to the full committee um, about, about a letter or a meeting or, or, or some particular um, voting point. Um, and um, just, just with the, the two of us occasionally looping in a third member uh, from, from Pelham occasionally, um, that worked pretty well. And I think one, one organizational advantage we have at the region is that we have a nine-member committee, and so a quorum is five. And so if, if you have up to four members working offline, then it's, it's, there's no open meeting lot issue. Um, so therefore, two or three is, is absolutely OK. Um, and I, fe I feel like a lot of the work that our subcommittees are tasked with doing is of the form. We have a discussion. So the like, policy subcommittee is a perfect example of this. 
I mean, we have a discussion, we have kind of an idea of where we want something to go, and then we say, okay, policy subcommittee, go draft some version off, offline. And then policy subcommittee works, you know, does that offline. They're not um, taking the decision-making authority away from the committee. There's no real, you know, movement on that front, but they're doing like that kind of uh, resource creation work and then bringing it back, get feedback, and then it kind of goes back and back. And so what I kind of feel is if, if we can accomplish that same task with two to four people, without the administrative overhead of a subcommittee, it's, it's just gonna make it more effective for us. Um, I, th I, think, I think it would really re kind of require each of the sub people who have served on those subcommittees kind of reflecting on whether it's a good fit. Like, I've never served on a policy subcommittee, so maybe <laughs> what I'm saying doesn't, um, but like the superintendent evaluation subcommittee is another good example of that, where um, there was certainly no intention and it didn't, you know, that, that was, we were offloading the decision-making authority, but there was a lot of churn that had to go, a lot of work had to go into working out those documents. Um, so that was, that was the first opportunity. And I certainly think that when we look at our list of subcommittees, if they haven't met in a while, that's a great candidate for mothballing the subcommittee. Because um, once, even if it's a very small focused uh, um, topic, uh, with, with the postings and the quorum and the meetings and the motions and all that, it just, it's, it's very time consuming. As, as we all know. Ms. Dancer. Well, I, it, my experience, um, again, you know, this is my first year and I was put on the budget subcommittee. I, I mean, it's something I'm interested in, the budget, and made the chair. And we had a couple of meetings <coughs> and, you know, it just kind of, here's the information and then we came to this meeting and here's the information again. And to me, it seemed like, why am I doing this in a subcommittee? and then coming here and doing it again. And others of you have been on that committee longer than I have, so I don't know how you feel about that. And I did talk briefly with Dr. Slaughter, um, and his, he had a good point, which is, you know, at this time, maybe there aren't particular issues with the budget, but there might be a time when money's really tight, and you might want to get feedback, but I'm wondering if, I. I if that again, that's something where you could get several people, and instead of having a formal subcommittee, but I don't have as much experience as the two of you do. So, Ms. Spitzer. Um, so I have been on the budget subcommittee, the superintendent's evaluation subcommittee, and the policy <laughs> subcommittee. Uh, okay. Currently serving on all of these, and I'm the OPEB person now. Gosh. <laughs> so, so balance amongst the members seems like something we definitely want to talk about. In terms of <laughs> yeah, right. And I know I'm sure. not the only one who maybe has a few more. Um, but, but, but anyways, getting back to what I want to talk about, one of the things I've realized as I've joined these subcommittees and been on them now for uh, two plus years maybe, is that there is a learning curve. So when I first joined the policy subcommittee, Debbie Westmoreland's on that, she was essential in us kind of getting our bearings and uh, you know also folks who have been on the subcommittees longer sometimes have that knowledge so when I joined the superintendent's um, evaluation subcommittee um, I believe Aubrey was still here and so anyways there, there were ways in which learning happens and um, some of that knowledge is held by individuals and so I guess my only fear if we move to kind of a totally a, you know rid of standing subcommittees is that I think we'd want to find a way to kind of maintain a person who would have that expertise in the way that you're kind of the advocacy <laughs> expert for lack of a better term. So I was thinking, you know, uh, thinking about this is like if we could find a way to maybe create a point person who would be the policy point person and as needed they could pull in others to help do the, the work because it is there is substantial work. And the other thing about this that I wanted to bring up is some of it's seasonal in terms of maybe there'll be more, like definitely with the superintendent's evaluation that that comes at the end of the year generally. You need a little planning in the beginning, but a lot of it comes later. So um, I guess just three things, making sure we, we, we maintain that institutional knowledge and maybe it's having a person on the committee and or, and or a person within the administration who could kind of be like an advisor type role. Um, and then also just, I think, making sure it's even across time and across members because some of these ebb and flow and you probably don't want to be on three subcommittees that suddenly, you know, have a spike in, mm -hmm. in um, at <laughs> activity at the same time. Ms. Dancer. It seems like there are different kinds of subcommittees. 
it sounds like some of the subcommittees really have work that they have to do and maybe some don't necessarily, I mean, I don't think, like, you know, my only experience is the budget subcommittee. I mean, the subcommittee doesn't create the budget. Um, you might provide some feedback of some kind, maybe, but that seems different than the policy or the eval, the superintendent evaluation. Those seem like very different kinds of tasks. But you've been on all three, so maybe you could offer your opinion. I'd agree they are different. Yeah. It's interesting listening because I what I what I hear is that it's 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 all work related, right? So it's the it's the work that we're doing and not is it the subcommittee or some other mechanism, but it's mm -hmm. work work that we have to do as a committee and how are we doing that work? And in some cases a standing committee or standing group might be the appropriate way and other mm -hmm. If we have a budget issue that we need to work through, that's work that happens, but maybe it's not. I'm just building on that. So I think it, it's interesting because I think something, you know, it's like it's the classic if there's a if there's a if there's an official subcommittee, well, we have to have meetings because we we exist. And and so I think if we, you know, it's, it's like looking at it from the other way rather than looking at it as that, well, we have these subcommittees and what do they do? thinking of it from the full committee perspective and what's the work that we need to do and how are we going to do that. And maybe for this particular case, we are going to choose to have a standing subcommittee or at least maybe have a remit for the for the year or six months mm -hmm. and a report's going to come back to us. Or um, we need to do the superintendent evaluation. Who, who wants to work on setting that up and be on point for that? And that's sort of an ad hoc. We have work that we need to do and it has to happen in between our official meetings. Um, I will say for the policy subcommittee, because I think with the exception of Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Westmoreland, we were all new because um, uh, Kara was also, Ms. Kastensen mm -hmm. from Pe um, Pelham was also mm -hmm. on that with us at the beginning. We were all new and it was really helpful to have that institutional knowledge um, between you know, between both of you, Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Westmoreland. I, I don't remember how many years you'd been on the Five. policy. Five, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think that point is really an important one. <clears throat> and Ms. Westmoreland was also, also uh, still does serve as sort of the, the what's the right word, shepherd sponsor, <laughs> Liaison, <yeah. laughs> faculty advisor <laughs> for, for that too. Um, so, it, it, you know, that model is, is, is kind of an interesting one. But when, when we first joined, we, there wasn't work that was coming from the from the full committee and it was only sort of in the last nine months that we actually had a high volume of, of work that had to be done. So it, it, it is interesting to have been on one subcommittee that went through sort of both scenarios of like, hmm, what are we going to work on? And then actually being tasked by the subcommittee, mm -hmm. the full committee, sorry, to do the work. Mr. Denley? Yeah, you know, so that, that being said, I do think we, we still do have subcommittees where it makes the structure of a subcommittee make sense. Mm -hmm. um, like some of the examples are like when, when we want there to be a regular opportunity for robust public participation. It's so like CPAC, I think, is a really good example of that. Um, we have school committee members on it, and yet we want the public engaged. Um, school Equity Task Force, I think, is a really good example of that. Um, and I think as we go through, you know, organizing and structuring, I think, um, you know, that, that might benefit from just a, an organizational refresh. It's, you know, it's been six, six years on and just looking at, you know, what are the, how do we want that structure? We have, we have other great groups um, as well uh, doing good work in that, in that space, um, you know, UROC and uh, Embrace Race and um, so to, uh, you know, but, uh, but that's, it's, I certainly don't see equity as, as something that, you know, is, is solved and then we, we put it away, you know, so <laughs> that's definitely something we want to continue and, ha and have that regular input. Um, but in terms of streamlining the structuring, I think it's you know it's a good opportunity to look at you know the, the time that's that's spent from from the public's perspective and from the school committee's perspective, and what's the you know what's the most efficient way to, to utilize all the all the opportunities for input on these topics. Would it be possible to see a list of all our subcommittees? You said it's a long list. I mean, maybe we could start by just going individually going through that and seeing 
or somebody telling us which ones are active and not active for those of us who are newer. Um, because you mentioned several things, and I don't know if they're subcommittees that I've never heard of. So um, I would mm -hmm. find that very helpful. That list was part of some agenda items in the, in the past. Right, right. And we, we haven't gone back to that. Um, in a while, so um, I'd like that <coughs> suggestion to go through that and um, and then come back. And I think um, picking up on Mr. Demling's comment, as I, I think you know, defining what is a subcommittee and and how you know again through the lens of how do we do our work and what is the role of a subcommittee versus a task force versus a working group, and how do we you know, what is that role? What 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 function does that play? And how 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 are they structured? Yeah. Technically, a subcommittee must post the agenda items and submit minutes. Is that the difference between it and other committees, other working groups? Um, they must post the agenda. My understanding is that they're all public meetings, so okay. fall <laughs> under the um, oh. open meeting law regardless okay. because they're, okay. so they all have to be posted. Yeah. Do they all have to submit minutes? Yes. Then I can't see no difference. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? So, we'll so we can sit, we can share out um, the list of subcommittees. That'd be great. Yep. And we'll on our next agenda item look at that uh, having that a future future meeting. <laughs> Thank you. So. Um, one thing that came up that Ms. McDonald and I have spoken about is, is currently there's not a representative from Leverett um, on the committee, and the Leverett School Committee invited me to their next meeting, which I believe is April 2nd or whatever Monday that is. I apologize. It wouldn't be the 2nd. Uh, perhaps it's the 6th. Um, to go and just talk a little bit about the Regional School Committee, and hopefully they'll work out their process. Also, the Amherst seat won't be filled. So a question that uh, Ms. McDonald and I discussed is uh, the one thing that really does need to happen at the next meeting is the Student Opportunity Act needs to be voted by the school committee. Sort of some of the other items, you know, that's why I was asking Mr. Slaughter, um, could be pushed to April 7th, where hopefully we have a, a closer to a full complement of school committee members. We don't have to push that, but we could, um, for instance, next week there's an Amherst School Committee meeting. and. If regional members were amenable in coming, we could have a regional meeting briefly before the Amherst meeting just to take care of that one item that needs to be done at the end of the month. Um, and and I, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm happy to go either way. I'm just conscious that there, there's one town not currently being represented on the committee, and there's also one town without its full complement of committee members. And, you know, is this an opportunity to perhaps um, – slow things down a little bit to get um, till that complement is restored. Even like the subcommittee conversation, I think was a useful mm -hmm. one. And then I'm still thinking, well, there's multiple people not right. in the room. Right. And I think the more conversations that get had without a full complement, the more times you're repeating those conversations a month later. Um, so again, I'm okay with either. And I think Ms. McDonald and I spoke about, I think we were both amenable to, to either. But if there was an interest in, in not having a meeting on March 24th and perhaps having a regional meeting on March 17th at the beginning, and Ms. McDonald wears both hats at the moment, so she's able to... Um, I'll talk you know. to the chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and just push some items till April till we have a more full complement. That's amenable to me. We could also have the full meeting on March 24th regardless. I just, I know for me, I and maybe I'm tipping my hand a little bit, I get conscious of, particularly when a full town isn't represented, having a lot of dialogue, you know, mm -hmm doesn't feel wonderful, yeah. and hopefully the Leverett Committee is able to appoint someone prior to the 7th. Um, so I, whatever the committee wants to do is fine with me on, on upcoming topics. The only one that I know we need to do uh, in the month of March uh, would be vote on the Student Opportunity Act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, the, in the bus contract. In the, in the bus, bus contract, I believe you said, was April 8th? Yeah, I think technically... Yeah, it's getting a little That's close, but uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I make a few people like our uh, recruitment officer a little nervous, but yeah, could wait. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just concerned we wouldn't have all the information right. within a week that would right. be sufficient for you to to have. Um, and I, I just just to add on that, so we, we're not fully represented, <laughs> and if you know more than three of us, uh, you know, or if three of us are not able to, right? So we have six. 
There's seven. Seven, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, and so that's why we, we polled this out today when we found out that um, Mr. Harrington wasn't able to attend, just making sure that we actually do have mm -hmm. quorum before we meet. So I, I do think, you know, so it's not to, to say, because um, Dr. Morse represented my perspective accurately, <laughs> is I'm, I'm fine either way. Uh, meeting on the 24th or pushing um, uh, and, and uh, just handling the votes that we need to at the prior to the Amherst School Committee meeting on the 17th. Um, but it is something that think about. I, I don't know if you know we know that that far in advance whether you'll be out of town or we won't know if we're sick. But um, it is something to be thinking about. Um, can I just ask for the Amherst School Committee meeting? Would we be meeting then at before 6 p.m. or would we? Maybe just We'd meet at 6 start. and start at 6.30. Okay. So the regional meeting would be at 6. At 6. Yeah. That would work for me. Yeah. It works. That's my corned beef time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Oh. You can bring it to the meeting. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring the crock pot to the meeting. <laughs> awesome. Oh, well, you might be out of here in time, too. There's no parade. No, no parade. But to Mr. Sullivan's point, it is St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so are we good? I yeah. prefer the modification, but... The, to yeah. the 17th? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll, we'll move forward with that plan. Okay. March 17th, and then the other items we'll, we'll put together from, for April 7th, and, and that may be a longer meeting, but hopefully a more fully represented meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A week from now, and that'll likely be at Amherst Town Hall. I'll confirm that. But um, for people who are regional members, uh, I think we did have a meeting there or two. But I just wanted to highlight that it wouldn't be in this space um, on April seventh, March seventeenth, March seventeenth. Oh, oh, yeah. oh okay. that quick meeting would would, would yeah. almost okay. certainly be at Amherst Town Hall and All not right. at this location. Thank you. Six o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. And there are gifts. Yes, we have gifts. Somebody want to read? Miss Dancer. Um, do we have to vote on these? Or do I just, I just, just so I, yep. I move that we accept is correct. Okay. I move that we accept the following gifts. Um, gift from Mass Mutual number 1000390, matching gift of M. O'Connor gift in honor of Caitlin O'Connor, $3,000 to PIP and $2,000 to Best Buddies as attached letter, total of $5,000. Gift from Florence Savings Bank number 210546 to support fiscal year 20. ARHS scholarship in the amount of $500. Anonymous gift, your cause, check number 56019724483 to support arms at principal discretion for $10. And gift from Mr. and Mrs. Ram and Mitlesh Gupta, two copies of India Unveiled for the high school and middle school libraries, estimated cost $113.82 for a total of $5,510. Second. Dr. Morris? Just a quick note, I know it's late, but the, the two books um, came uh, in a box from uh, a family that's trying to um, donate books uh, about different parts of the world all over the state and absolutely gorgeous images. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. I enjoyed, I looked up with Mr. Sheen because we just, anytime we're going to bring a gift to you all, we evaluate it. Um, just, just truly incredible. I think it'll catch a lot of students' eye as well as having a lot of good content. But I just want to thank the family mm -hmm. for, they have no connection to Amherst. It's just their passion to be uh, donating these books to different libraries <laughs> where um, middle school and high school students have access to them. So I thought it was just kind of a neat story and mm -hmm. um, it came in one of those, you know, like hand, but, you know, it wasn't just from a publisher. It was like a hand-packaged hand set of these um, just incredibly large, mm. wonderful books. So I thought nice. I'd share that. Nice. Good. Any further discussion? No? All those in favor? Signal by raising your hand. Six zero. Good
advance on the motion? I move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. <laughs> Mr. Deming got it first. <laughs> no discussion. All those in favor, raise your hand. Six to zero. We're adjourned. <laughs>